Good morning. Would the members of the Planning and Growth Management Committee please report to Committee Room 1 for quorum? Good morning. Uh, welcome to meeting 31 of the Planning and Growth Management Committee. Welcome to members of the committee and to other members of the public in attendance and to the members watching us at www.toronto.ca forward slash council. For those in the room with us, the screen at the back of the room provides real-time updates concerning where we are and the items that are coming up next. Planning and Growth Management Committee gratefully acknowledges it is meeting on the traditional territory, the Mississaugas, the New Credit First Nation, the Hadwasani, the Huron-Wendat, and home to many diverse Indigenous people. We have a lengthy agenda today because we have a lot of uh, deputations on Midtown in Focus that is scheduled for a little bit later this morning at 11.30. But at the start of the meeting, while well, we have more of the staff here and people are here, I just did want to take a minute to thank all the city staff, and I'm talking about our planning staff, our building staff, our clerk staff, and our legal staff, who we always have Brian and his crew around keeping an eye on us to make sure we do things in a proper manner. Um, to, just to take a moment to thank everybody. Um, this term of council for me has been quite unique. I accepted the responsibilities to work with my great colleagues over here on this committee and chair it and thought at the beginning, as I've said in private to a few people, great. You got 10 meetings a year, they drop some stuff on the agenda, we go through it, we approve it and we go on. And little did I realize how much it involved not just the planning division, but the building division and our legal staff in trying to deal with so many applications that have been appealed and the issues we have in trying to deal with the development in the city. Uh, and I really have to say, I've had the opportunity to chair and be part of many uh, committees and agencies of the city over the years I've been in service here. And you really are, I think, one of the, if not the greatest group that's there. Your dedication, your hard work, your understanding, all of you, uh, in every division, in every uh, quarter of the city, where we've got the different districts, uh, I think is just phenomenal. The, the hard work that you all do in trying to wrestle with the uh, tremendous, tremendous pressures the city's under in the way of growth, the tremendous public pressures that we have, uh, and the way that uh, issues come through both our committee and the major issues and through city council from our districts is phenomenal. Uh, I think that uh, to all of you, and I'm sure it's from all of my members here because we speak all the time. 
uh, a real heartfelt thanks for all your dedication, hard work, and uh, wonderful, uh, wonderful ways that you attack these uh, great problems that we have and make them seem so little to people when we, and, and try and help so many times through it. So you've done an absolutely wonderful job, but I just wanted to express that at the beginning of the meeting when you're here, and in particular to my colleagues here on the committee. Uh, also thanks to them, because it is a collective group that works here, I think, from councillors making recommendations to City Council, and I think you've all done a pretty darn good job over the last four years of dealing with that as well. So thank you very much to all of you. We have an agenda to deal with here. So, the first item on the agenda, which is scheduled for 945, which I've hit, is the technical amendments to the zoning bylaw 5692013 and the zoning bylaws of the former municipalities. I don't have any speakers, so we can just deal with that if there's a motion on it. Oh, I have to give you one minute. The clerk's clock is different than that. Okay. PG 31.2 is for 10 o'clock. PG 31.3 is for 10.15. PG 31.4, second units, official plan amendment, final recommendations. I do not have any listed speakers, but that's for 10.30. PG 31.5 is for 11.15. PG 31.6 is for 11.15. PG 31.7 is for 11.30. PG 31.8, City Planning Division Study Work Program Update. We can deal with that one now. And there are some motions on it and some questions. So the motions are from staff. So can you let the committee know what the motions are and then we can ask questions? These are some staff recommended motions. Can you put them up on the screen? So there are some amendments to the work plan for the Heritage Conservation Districts. So questions of staff. Councillor Perks. Oh, you have a motion. Oh, Councillor Fletcher, questions of staff. I just wanted to clarify, yesterday we had a um, good conversation and motions at Toronto and East York Community Council and I want to clarify through the chief planner that indeed our complete streets, uh, this we can be looking at complete streets, you have enough capacity for that, that um, for the Danforth, that the Gerard Car Law, which is a smart track station, that that will be able to proceed, that that's all in the work plan, two fairly large chunks of work that I know planning staff will be involved in. And in the case of the uh, Gerard Carla Smart Track Station, we'll be leading. Uh, through, the, through the chair, yes. Uh, the Danforth Phase 2 work yes. is listed in Attachment 3 as active. Yes, as active. And uh, so, again, this was written, probably finalized eight weeks ago, so it's a moment in time, a moment in time, but uh, as we proceed with the work program, um, it, it will be advanced in accordance with the direction from uh, committee uh, and council. Uh, and I am looking quickly to confirm the Dundas, uh, or the Gerard Carla work. Um, I don't know if staff can highlight for me if it's captured in there or not. But uh, in general, the smart track station work uh, is captured in the major transit station area work program. Okay. So I would consider that to be captured. Covered off. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Sorry, before I go on with more questions, the clerk has reminded me that I was supposed to check if there were any declarations of interest. Seeing none, confirmation of the minutes. Moved by Councillor DiCiano. 
All those in favor, opposed, carried. Now we can go on with questions. Councillor Perks. Um, thank you. Uh, first, on this amendment, uh, this looks like we're dropping a number of heritage conservation studies, just deleting them all together? Through the chair, actually we're not. Um, we inadvertently placed those um, items on both attachments two and attachments three. <gasps> they haven't started yet. They're starting uh, 2019 and beyond, where attachment two indicates matters that have been initiated and will be completed. So That's we don't... cleaning it up. It's okay. cleaning it up for clarity and not wanting to confuse anyone. Okay. The same thing with attachment three. Those two items have actually started and they're reflected on both attachments. So we duplicated them in error. So we're just trying to clean it up to be consistent to reflect the work underway. I see, okay, so thank you. Um, in looking through the ones that are on hold, there are a whole whacking big number of them that are uh, heritage studies that are on hold. Is this just a capacity issue or? Well, I'll start and maybe Ms. Von Bacchus can uh, add. The, the, um, the experience that we're having um, is uh, is that they tend, they are tending to take longer than we had anticipated, first of all. So they're, they're stretching out. Uh, we've got a number that have been adopted and, and are at the LPAT now, three major ones of significance. So that's taking staff resources away because they're in mediations with the St. Lawrence HCD, the uh, Kings Bedina will be next, and the Young Street HCD. Um, and the, the experience of, of starting them through the study process and then into the plan process. So all told, it's uh, perhaps an overly ambitious uh, work program. Uh, we're, the, the study work program is the full inventory of, of what we've got on the docket and we are getting uh, to them as quickly as we can with, uh, given, given the, uh, the amount of staff, that we, staff resources that we have to, to accommodate the work. I don't know. Carrie, if you want to add to that. I think uh, the chief planner correctly reflected some of the challenges we've had. And, and I'll just add one additional point, um, which this committee is very familiar with, um, with the constant churn that we experience with staff at times. Um, we have to fill positions and then we have gaps in our staffing um, to get up and running on some of our studies. Okay. Um, I, looking through this, I see that we have some challenges coming because of uh, proposed or changes at the province, and who knows what's going to happen with that. But with the new major transit study, like uh, new rules around major transit nodes, the new um, affordable housing requirements, and the uh, new standard for what we have to do to be appeal proof under the LPAT. I mean, that's an, those, just those three. Do we have to go and redo a whole lot of studies that we've already done? I, I didn't hear the last point, sorry. Like, we so, have to we, so I'm thinking, for example, I have an avenue study uh, that is near a major transit node, yeah. and, but it's eight years old. So do we have to go and redo all that work? or? So we, we have, an, uh, through the chair, sorry, uh, we have a number of challenges. First, uh, our first challenge is with the new growth plan coming into effect in June of 2017, it requires any matters coming forward to conform with it. So it's a little bit of a challenge of having a new plan coming forward and expecting everything to conform simultaneously. So as we go forward with our applications and with our studies, we look to see how we can best conform on an individual or area basis with the new growth plan. Part of the 2019 work program, though, will be to initiate, and a report will be coming forward to committee as to what is going to be required and entailed in terms of the new five-year review, MTSAs, work with respect to inclusionary zoning. So it is going to be an ambitious work program where we're going to have to be directing a number of our resources to completing those in a quick and timely fashion. Well, I, I guess I'm, I have a, to be very specific. So there's a property in my ward 
uh, we did an avenue study, Bloor Dundas. Based on the avenue study, a development application at Bloor and Dundas was turned down at the OMB. Now the, the new growth plan changes the rules. Uh, there's a new owner of the site, and they came and saw me, and what, they want to apply for even more than what the OMB turned down. They say, thanks to the new rules, they'll be able to get it. So my question, I guess, is more like, we have, I don't know, a hundred avenue studies that were done. Are, are they all sort of up in the air until we can nail down the, the new growth plan requirements or are a large portion of them up in the air? Through the chair, I would say that the matters that are in effect are in effect as we go forward on all applications and you would have noted on the uh, community council agendas where we were being uh, far more explicit with respect to how a matter conforms or doesn't conform with the growth plan. Because we haven't done our conformity exercise yet, doesn't mean a matter doesn't conform with the growth plan. So each application will have to address the growth plan requirements. I would, I would just supplement that in the evaluation, and it's 100, I think there's a, roughly 160 major transit station areas to assess, so we will go through that due diligence and look at the, uh, the way the growth plan um, requires density minimums, for example, and other areas of conformity. Um, and there'll be a sifting process where uh, some work that has been done, so, so for example, Midtown and Focus, TO Core, uh, various reviews of avenues, we may already be just fine with the minimum density requirements of the growth plan. And in other areas, we may find that we, are, are, uh, we have to reassess the planning permission in that area. So it's a sifting exercise. We've begun that exercise in order to ultimately um, be able to bring forward recommendations for conformity with the growth plan overall. And we have begun that assessment and will be proceeding with that work in 2019. I'll come back to you if you want, please. Because Councillor DeChannel, you had some questions. Yeah, thank you. And it's just to, for clarification on, uh, I guess, your motion. The <clears throat> in the work plan, um, the junction uh, HCD is in there twice, as we've heard. Uh, on one side, on attachment two, it's it's in there. But on attachment three, it says hold. So we're taking your motion takes it out of attachment three. Is that correct? Through the chair, that's correct. Okay, so uh, is, when does that uh, heritage study be begin? Um, my understanding is Heritage will be reporting out on the matter in 2019 Q4. When you say reporting out on the matter, that means bringing us a, a final report? Yes. In 2019? That's correct. Okay, thank you. Um, I have just a brief question for confirmation. The Shepherd Avenue East study wasn't listed in here. You see the, uh, through the chair, the date of the report uh, uh, reflects, in fact, data collection that took place some weeks before that. So it would not have captured the final, uh, perhaps the final one or two meetings of community council and, and this committee. So if there have been uh, more recent um, motions to add to the work program, that will be, that is being tracked by staff and will be added in, in in the next report that we make on the work program. So I know that Mr. Nanos is here as well. Is it one that will be started in 2019? Yes. Thank you. That's, uh, you're referring to Shepherd. Shepherd. Shepherd, yes. Councillor Perks, you had more questions? Yeah. So. Um, all of the work that we're going to have to do, the sifting exercise you described, uh, none of that's, none of that's uh, chargeable to development fees. That's all just tax-based staff, right? Yes. So there's a, we're going to have a very large new workload, it would seem to me, on the tax-based side. And I'm, uh, I guess I'm just going to be watching when we... Uh, should I be lucky enough to be here next year about whether we're allocating enough resources to handle this very child, like what I see just from 
my ward, very challenging and substantial new piece of work when we're already struggling just to keep up. So through the chair, my only comment on that would be, uh, that's good that you'll be watching. Um, the, uh, the, uh, the, um, the work program shifts over time on a five or 10 year cycle. So for example, the city has been through um, a municipal comprehensive review and there have been um, strategic initiative staff allocated to getting that done. Uh, we're still at the LPAT on various matters, but it's coming to a conclusion over the next year or so. And some of that staff can be uh, utilized to uh, shift onto the next uh, work program items around uh, MTSAs, which is a comprehensive piece of policy work. Um, it may be, however, um, that we have to, for example, have uh, or consider and ask for uh, zoning staff um, because ultimately uh, the growth plan calls for implementing zoning. And we don't always take our study work to its fullest extent, which is uh, an implementing zoning bylaw. Um, my preference would be, and we have done this in the past on St. Clair, uh, in King Parliament, in King Spadina, and various other avenues where we actually implement the full package, the OP, the guidelines, and the zoning, so that we have a full, up-to-date, conforming uh, understanding of what the, um, of what the uh, development parameters should be, which brings certainty to the marketplace and puts council in a much better position to conform under the new rules of the Bill 139. And I think at the end of the day, allows council to make decisions, responsible decisions, accountable decisions, um, but decisions that won't be appealed. So it ultimately, you know, I think this, if we invest in this type of um, work program approach, will, um, will, you know, uh, be a much better way to go about planning the city. Thank you. Are there any other questions of staff? Not seeing any. Uh, I am going to make a suggestion to my colleagues. I, I would like to hold this down and to send it forward with a motion that will support um, what we've seen here as a committee over the last four years. It was actually because of this committee that we have these reports coming here. It didn't come before to committee or council what the work plan was and it was something that we asked for and we now have. Uh, even based on the questions that are healed here between Bill 139, which is substantial changes, between the development review initiative that we're undergoing, uh, the new government being at the province, which we don't know how it's gonna take twists or turns as go forward, the LPAT that's here. Uh, I think, and, and there's an issue with staffing, and I know Councillor Perks uh, always brings that up. But when we deal with that with the finance department, they also talk to us about the number of vacancies that are in place because the difficulty that is there in filling the vacancies. So I think it's important that when the new year comes and at the end of the first quarter, there be a review as to the staffing levels to be sure that they're in place to manage the work that's being required of the division. And if there's anything else that has to be added to the budget process, it be considered now as part of the budget process. And we also have to find a way to encourage uh, our resources and through human resources to advance the job that's really needed to replace the staff as if we put a position out or open up a new position uh, and someone internally applies, we haven't added anybody. We've simply moved somebody up the ladder and we continue to have the vacancies that we have seen reoccurring. And I, I think, Greg, the last time that we talked with finance, they had talked about 24 vacant positions in planners alone. Do you, this, I know they're substantial now still, and it's nothing to do with the planning department. It's just the way the process takes. And I think we have to find a way to fix that process and get the staff in place that we're budgeting for and make sure they're budgeting right. So when Mr. Gigeronimo gets down here, I know he was stuck in a meeting, I'm gonna discuss it with him and I will draft a motion for you all to consider at that time to support this and, and put it forward. If there's no other speakers or questions, we can deal with it then, but my motion will be just to 
hold this down and then we'll deal with it a little bit later. Okay. Getting to one item that we haven't finished. Um, we have come far enough along to deal with the 945 item, which is PG 31.1, technical amendments to the zoning bylaw 569213 and the general zoning bylaws of the former municipalities. There are no speakers on that. Is there a mover of that? Councillor Campbell. I'm glad that you have the time to read that. So, item number one, PG 31.1, technical amendments to the zoning bylaw 569213, moved by Councillor Campbell. All those in favor? Any opposed? That is carried. Now, item PG 31.2, 721 Eastern Avenue. I know our uh, colleague is here in regards to that. There are some supplementary materials that are here in front of us. Councillor Fletcher, is this the one that you wanted to bring a motion to us as well? Yes, uh, Mr. Chair, there's motions that are being prepared now, and I'd okay, like so to have a chance to go over them. This is a public so. hearing. Are there any speakers that wish to speak to this? We'll hear them now, we'll have your motion, and then we'll, we'll hold it down for your Thank motion. You. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Chair and members of committee, good morning. I'm Jane Papino and I'm the um, uh, lawyer for GM, General Motors of Canada, the applicant here. We support virtually all of the staff report. As the councillor has noted, there's some last minute tweaks. We've been working very closely with her and with your planning staff. I simply wish to say on behalf of GM that we join what, we st what you started the meeting with um, in offering and extending huge thanks to the councillor and to your staff. There have been many, many months of very close work on this issue uh, and on this development. It uh, promises the ability to spark and catalyze economic employment development for the east end of South of, of Eastern to bookend the Unilever development. And we just wanted to say thank you and uh, we're looking forward to seeing the draft uh, resolutions and the final tweaks and the supplementary report. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ms. Papino. Wonderful to have you here saying you're nice supporting things. it completely. <laughs> Compared to yesterday. Oh, yeah. okay. <laughs> no, we, it worked out all right. Gotta watch that tape. <laughs> uh, are there any other public speakers? I don't see any. Uh, we'll bring it into uh, mem non members of committee. Uh, do you just want to ask us to hold it down for I that? Would, I or do would, you want to speak Chair, to it now? Because there are a number of motions still coming that are pretty significant, and the whole section 37. So when that's all ready and I've gone over it carefully, then I'd be able to make that motion later today. So with the committee's permission, we'll move to hold this down, and we'll come back to it when our colleague has the motions prepared and circulates them to us. Yes. And then we'll deal with it. Thank all those you so in much. favor, opposed, that's carried, so we're holding that down. Okay, so item number nine, how does the city grow our update? And we have a presentation I think we can have for that. So we have the time and there's a presentation I think available. Who's gonna give it for us? Through the chair, that would be Michael Wright from our strategic initiatives unit and the presentations being Handed out currently by the clerk. All right, and just before Michael, you begin. Uh, item number ten: official plan of review, further proposed transportation policy direction for consultations. There are no speakers, and we can deal with that if that's okay with the committee. Is there a mover of the item? Item number 10, 31.10, we can deal with it. We're we going to clear off the other ones if there's no one that wants to deal with them while well, Michael's getting set up. 
You have questions? Then I'll hold it down. Item number 11, OPA indicators. If you wish to hold it, it's fine. If you don't, then we'll just deal with it. To adopt, is that the motion? There is a motion to adopt the recommendations. There's no questions of my colleagues. All those in favor? Any opposed? That's carried. And PG 31.12, secondary suites as well. There's no speakers. Are there any members of committee that wish to hold it? If not, we can deal with that one as well. Moved by Councilor Diciano. Staff recommendations. All those in favor? Any opposed? That's carried. So now we are back to Michael. You ready for us? Yes, Mr. Chair. We're dealing with nine right now. <coughs> Go for it. Chair, members of the committee, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. I'm Michael Wright, the manager of research and information in the city planning division. <laughs> My colleague. Uh, Kate Hill Montague and I are going to summarize the remarkable trends in development activity in the city over the past five years. We're going to start by looking backwards over the past 20. According to CMHC, there's been a steady upward trend in housing starts and completions over the past 20 years, up to that remarkable peak of almost 31,000 units in 2015, settling back down to about 14,000 units in 2017, which is just about the average rate of units built within the city over the past 15 years. This represents a particularly strong housing market. Since the 1990s, the housing completions in the city have stepped upwards by an additional 15,000 units on average in every five-year period up to the last five years, now totaling over 85,000 units built. The bulk of the city's supply is in the form of mid-rise and high-rise apartment units and consequently an increasing proportion of the development activity is happening within the city as compared to the GTA, now over one-third of the units built. Based on the magnitude of the development pipeline, that growth is likely to continue. Over the last five years, there have been 2,400 projects going on within the city, and taken together, they propose a total of 376,480 residential units. If all of that potential were realized and occupied at the average occupancy rate of mid-rise and high-rise apartments in, per the 2016 census, it would add over 750,000 people to the city's population. It would be the equivalent of adding the city of Mississauga to the city's population plus another 30,000 people. The pipeline also contains non-residential projects that are proposing for the first time over 10 million square meters of non-residential space. If realized, that would be the equivalent of adding about 50 First Canadian places to the total non-residential space within the city. Those development projects are at various points and stages within the city's development approvals processes. On the residential side, there's about 146,000 units in development proposals which have been received and are still under review. There's another 144,000 units in projects uh, that are at various stages of approval, both planning and buildings. And there's another roughly 84,400 units that are ready for occupancy or that were completed within that five-year period from 2013 to 2017. The pipeline provides a five-year moving window, a snapshot of the flow of development activity through the city's approvals processes and construction. The city and its stakeholders continue to do their part in order to advance development proposals through the uh, city's approvals processes in that the number of units within planning projects that have received at least their first planning approval and are continuing through the approvals has outpaced the number of housing units started in each of the last five years. The impact of all of this potential housing is significant. If we take the number of dwelling units that were on the ground per census day and the number of units that were built in roughly the 18-month period between mid-year 2016 and year-end 2017 together, that represents just over 1.2 million dwelling units within the city. The pipeline contains another roughly 190,000 units of housing potential. If all of those units were realized 
it would increase the city's total housing stock by almost one quarter. We can use this information in order to assess the city's progress with respect to the growth plan forecasts. According to the household forecast supporting the uh, provincial growth plan for the Greater Golden Horseshoe, it anticipated that the city would need to accommodate some 399,000 households in the city over the 40-year period to 2041. According to CMHC, over half of those units have already been built. In the development pipeline, there's another 144,000 units, or about 36% of the required units, which have their first planning approval and are still moving through the approvals process. Taken together, this is about 370,000 units, or 93% of the units required to accommodate the forecasted growth that are already in hand in the first 16 years of the 40-year forecast period. It will take some time for that housing to be realized, but it's a significant component. In addition, there's another 146,000 units and applications that are still under review. Not all development proposals are approved, and not all approved projects are built, but this is a strong indication that the city has on the order of 129% of the total supply required to accommodate that forecasted growth. If we take into account uh, an estimated demolition rate to realize this new housing, we would still have a surplus of about 16% above the required units. So Toronto was well on its way to housing the population growth forecasted by the growth plan. Next we turn our attention to citywide development activity. Looking at residential development in the city, over 86,000 units across the city have already been built in the five-year period. There's an additional 144,000 units in active projects, and these are projects which have had their initial planning approval, but are still moving through the approvals process and are not yet built. And further, 146,000 residential units under review, and these are projects for which there's not, they have not yet been approved or refused or under appeal. Altogether, this accounts for 1,500 residential projects proposing over 36,000 residential units in about 3.5 million square meters of residential gross floor area. The projects are concentrated in the downtown and central waterfront area, within the centres and along the avenues, with particular concentrations along the Eglinton and Shepherd corridors where transit has been built. For the first time since amalgamation and our tracking of development in the city, over 10 million square metres of non-residential GFA is proposed in the development pipeline. Non-residential projects are those that contain industrial, office, retail or institutional GFA. There's 2.6 square million square meters of non-residential space built over the five-year period, with an additional 3.6 million square meters of non-residential space that has received an initial planning approval, but is still moving through the approvals process, um, and that has not yet been built. There's an additional 4.1 million square meters of non-residential GFA still under review, 40% of which are located in the designated employment lands demonstrating a market demand and need to preserve the city's employment lands for business and future job growth. Altogether, this accounts for 1,400 non-residential projects, accounting for over 10 million square meters of non-residential GFA, 30% of which are located in the employment areas. Next, we turn our attention to the official plan geography. The development pipeline provides an important metric for assessing the success of the official plan policies. The development pipeline indicates that a large majority of the proposed development in the pipeline is in the areas targeted for growth by the official plan. Over 83% of the residential units in the pipeline are proposed in growth areas with concentrations in the downtown, the centers, along the avenues, and within mixed-use areas throughout the city. 87% of the non-residential gross floor area in the development pipeline is located in growth management areas, 28% of which are in the employment areas. Downtown is changing rapidly. The downtown and central waterfront area contain the largest proportion of development in the city and account for 37% of the residential units and over 40% of the non-residential GFA. The area between Queen Street and the waterfront has attracted increasingly large residential development. The secondary plan areas are part of the city's growth management framework and they manage growth within a local context. 36% of the projects in the development pipeline are covered by a secondary plan area, and this map shows that 869 development projects are located in a secondary plan area. This represents 64% of the residential units and over half of the non-residential gross floor area in the city. The most recent addition to the city's secondary plan areas is the downtown plan, and this secondary plan area was adopted by council in May of this year and is unique as a local and national economic hub. It is the largest secondary plan area in the city and it contains 440 development projects within its borders. 
Finally, the employment areas continue to provide an attractive location for employment related development projects. The current pipeline contains over 850,000 meters square of industrial growth floor area, over 80% of which are located in the employment areas, with no a notable concentration in the core employment areas. This strong development activity is matched by employment growth over the last five years. Our Toronto Employment Survey shows that there has been an increase in employment in both the core and general employment areas, adding over 32,000 jobs in the last five years. In general, the official plan is working. Growth is occurring in accordance with Council policy. There is a great deal of development activity happening within the city, both residential and non-residential. The pattern tends to reflect the city's urban structure. The concentrations within the city emphasize the importance of continuing to promote employment and mixed-use development across the city, as well as the corresponding infrastructure in order to implement it. Thank you for your time and attention. Questions? Uh, Councillor Fillion. The, um, there's a statement on page 14 of this document that says non-residential development activity in the centres is strongest in North York Centre, and I was just baffled by that. Um, because we haven't had an office building built in North York Centre in many years. We've had a gazillion condos and we've been trying to get commercial development and not getting it. The, uh, the development pipeline, th sorry, through the chair, the development pipeline summarizes the flow through of development projects at various stages in the approvals process. So the project might not have been completed. But in Table 3 of the Bolton on page 4, there's a summary of the non-residential projects. And North York Centre contains 40% of the total proposed non-residential space. So it might not have happened recently, but it's over a period of time that the activity would be realized. But uh, I, I don't know what you mean. Do you mean approved but not built yet? Is represents 40? Like, I can only think of one project which the... Uh, person who has the approval um, is inclined not to build. Uh, other than that, I can't think of anything. These, through the chair, these represent the projects that were in the pipeline over the five years between 2013 and 2017 at various stages of approval. So there is non-residential GFA that was built in those five years, other projects that are still going through the approvals process, and those which are still under review. The total is 110,000 square meters. Right, and I, and I, you know, I guess I'll take this offline. I just think that's incorrect. I, I don't know what, what you could possibly be counting. Uh, through the chair, we can provide you with a, a list of the projects if that would be helpful. Okay, and this, this will be going to council, correct? Um, then I'd like to, I kind of question some of this data and I, I guess I would like to hold it down until I get that information because I can't imagine what it could be. So I'm fine with you getting data today, but can you clarify exactly what you're asking the staff well, to bring it, back it, to you? It paints a picture here as if a North York, um, center is the booming area for non-residential development and that would be um, um, a very good news to the local councillor were that true uh, it, so uh, i would love to be shown that it's true i i'm highly skeptical so you're asking them to bring forward where they got the data from yes yes because it's this is a report on data that you've been provided, am I correct? Through the chair, it's information that we have collected through monitoring the development approvals process so that we keep track of all the applications uh, for sites across the city and we gather them together into projects that represent a single site. So we're keeping track of all that information. So will you be able to get that information from my colleague to see if we stand this down so he can understand where you got it from or can't she? We'll I'm trying to understand how to satisfy the concern. Well, and, and the, if it was just information that didn't matter to anything, I guess I'd say, okay, let's talk about it later. But um, this kind of information does matter to things like Ontario Municipal Board hearings that are upcoming on, um, you know, sites where we're proposing offices and 
other people um, and the applicants are not so um, planner you know, has I, a suggestion so. I, I might suggest through the chair that we um, uh, do that line by line review um, and we if we find an error we can post an addendum after consulting with you we can post an addendum this is an online document it's an information document that as you note, will be in the public domain and we want it to be correct so we will look again at those projects and if we determine that there is wrong information we'll correct it and post a correction I'm, um, I'm not aware I, I'm not aware okay. of, of without looking at it um, we can't I, Dylan, why, why don't you just draft I don't mind a motion that asked for that was clerks out for staff to review that uh, with a, and consult with a local councillor in the area and post any um, modifications to the plan as necessary. I think we can try and write a motion like that for you that'll deal with it. Okay. Um, my second question, um, I, I guess if- Sorry, I'll you, take extra time because I interrupted your- Yeah, uh, second question, just to the chief planner that um, we, I think it's, unless you disagree with the statement, the premise is that we have um, um, kind of extreme overdevelopment in some areas, North York Center, Young and I'm sure there are others, and um, fairly extreme underdevelopment in some other areas like avenues where we would like to see development. Uh, if that statement is correct, what can we do about that? Uh, I, would, I would agree with you that that statement is generally correct. It actually, in the indicators report, we identify how we're doing vis-a-vis -vis the growth plan minimum targets. So in North York, uh, in uh, Young and Eglinton and uh, downtown, we're, downtown we're close to meeting them. Uh, Young and Eglinton and North York were exceeding and Etobicoke and Scarborough were below. Uh, avenues, uh, some area avenues are, uh, uh, we're seeing more development than others. Um, I think, you know, zoning and official plan policy is not a panacea for um, distributing that growth. We have a structure plan and you can see through the data that 80, more than 80% of the growth is happening where, the, where we intend it to happen. So overall, that's a good thing. Uh, it's, it, the plan is structured to, uh, to uh, unite our land use strategy and our transportation strategy, both existing and proposed transportation. So f fundamentally, we're growing in the right way, but we are growing unevenly. And uh, we, we look to other devices to encourage and stimulate the growth in those areas. I would put a lot of emphasis on the transportation network, building uh, and enhancing the bus, LRT, subway, smart track, all of that, those suite of transportation changes is essential to bringing growth and opportunity to other areas of the city that aren't experiencing that growth and change. So a good example of that is right in Weston where we have new, um, new uh, development happening that hasn't happened in the past uh, related to uh, new transportation infrastructure. Um, the other thing is, you know, uh, is incentives and uh, uh, making, you know, finding a, finding a way to, uh, through, through development but also through other financial incentives to uh, bring development to areas like Etobicoke or, or uh, North York or Scarborough where uh, through, the, through the IMET grant and through other um, uh, efforts that we can make to, to nudge the marketplace and to create confidence in those locations. I think fundamentally we're trying to, we're trying to develop mixed use areas where people can uh, work and live uh, and experience life in that area and don't have to move around but we need to create more of those kinds of locations around the city um, but I would agree with your overall comment that it's a it's a challenge it's a fundamental challenge really that you're articulating about how uh, how uneven uh, the growth is with with, with uh, such a hot market really in some areas of the city and a flat market in in other areas of the city I have another question related to that would you like me to ask it now or come back uh, let's come back. We'll go around if there's other questions. So can I, I do, can you help me with the population you had in for the number of units in 2000, the number of units now, the number of units 
and our population with what's on the books because I found that a little bit scary. Chair, is this the slide that you were thinking of? Any one. I was looking at it and trying to figure out where we were, where we are, and where we're going to. So on, uh, in response to your question, the large blue bar represents the total number of dwelling units reported by the 2016 census. So these were the total number of dwelling units in the city on the ground on census day, which is roughly in May of 2016. So that's 1.2 million units. Just under 1.2 million. Where were we in 2000 or thereabouts? Or what number that you have can give me a historical reference? Because you're telling me that we're, with what's in the pipeline, you're going to add another over 300,000 units. Uh, in response to your question, uh, I would need to review the census data for the, the nearest census would be 2001. Do none of your charts go back and show how much we've grown or not? Not in terms of uh, dwelling units, total dwelling units on the ground, no. The number of dwelling units as reported by the census in each census year has reflects the total development activity and occupancy of those units. And the numbers have been on the order in 2001 on the order of 979,000 units. Sorry, I can't hear you. The number of dwelling units on the ground in, uh, in the census years, as I recall, in 2001 would be on the order of 979,000 units. But I'd have to confirm that figure by checking the census numbers. Okay, so that's close enough. So then this is then dealing with the concern. You're under a million. 15 years ago, just under, and your 1.1, we've got about 200,000 units in the last 15 years. You're showing me now in the pipeline is how many units? About 190,000 units in total, including those which are in the approvals process and those which are still under review. You've got numbers here, 143 and 146. So the 143,858 represents units and projects which are still in the planning approvals process. They have for their initial planning approval, but are still continuing through other approvals as well as uh, building permit application stages. And the uh, units, the last column, the 146,000 units, are in projects that are still under review which may not be approved. And the 23,000? And the 23,000 represents CMHC's housing completions for the 18 months between roughly mid-year 2016 and year-end 2017. So in order to get an equivalent total relative to the, the pipeline endpoint, we've added together the units reported by the census, total dwelling units, and added on the CMHC's completions since that time. So roughly speaking, from 2001 to 2016, 200,000 new units in the city. I would have to confirm that Roughly. 2001 figure. In the pipeline that we already have is over three. Some of those units were built within the pipeline period and thus they're included okay, in this larger blue box. Since, since the 2016 census, so the last two years, what's in the pipeline and what's been built is 313,000 units, give or take a few. Close. Well, you got 143, 146, and 23. So I'm adding them together to say what was built since 2016, what's been approved and not built, and what's in the pipeline. That first figure, the 143,000, is uh, already. In, or sorry, the 86,400 units that are, are the units built. Those were built within the pipeline period. So we can't add those in. That would be double counting the units that were on the ground the 1.2 million uh, total dwelling units on the ground as of year-end 2017. So that's why we've only added in these two, uh, two remaining components of the pipeline, which are the units which are proposed and still under review, and the units still going through the approvals process. So the intent here is to avoid any double counting. Okay, thank you. Um, Councilor Filling, you had more questions? Uh, yes, just, um, you know, related to overdevelopment in certain areas. So, and we've talked about lack of transportation infrastructure, which is 
seems to be our big concern, but um, there's also, to pick one that we have no control over, um, uh, school infrastructure, you know, childcare infrastructure, parks infrastructure, community center infrastructure. Um, at, at what point, if at all, under the new planning regime, which gives us a little bit more say, um, can we say, you know what, this, I know the official plan might allow more development here, but it's just proceeding too quickly and the community, there's, there's just, isn't the social or physical infrastructure to absorb any more people until that catches up. At what point can we say we're just putting a hold on everything? Uh, through the chair, so how much is too much, I think is the question. And uh, certainly it's uh, relevant when you consider how the committee has been um, looking at over the last four years, uh, various planning frameworks and other planning frameworks coming through community council. And the idea with that is to, uh, with the underpinning of the growth plan is to calibrate um, a growth projection with, with uh, hard and soft infrastructure needs assessment, if you will, um, so that we can better align uh, what we feel we need to maintain livability and sustainability overall um, and, and make a closer connection between the pace of growth and the provision of infrastructure. I think over the years, um, the growth may have used up uh, excess infrastructure, certainly piped infrastructure, and we've crossed a line where we're now hearing more and more about Toronto water issues, for example, than we ever did in the past. Um, but we have to be, in the new regime, I think we have to be more rigorous and dutiful about um, developing policy that, um, you know, monitors and watches that growth application by application and um, support it with infrastructure strategies, which we have in front of you for the various planning frameworks so that we know how many community centers, we know, you know, in a rough global kind of way, we know how many community centers, um, even, even for things that we don't control, we, it, we, we go after the agencies that may control them, the outside agencies, for example, the school board, to make sure that they're aware of the growth projection and they, they can plan well in advance for those school sure. sites. And, and that that's, the, that's the overall gambit, is to make sure that we're doing a better job of aligning growth and infrastructure. Sure, and, I, and that addresses long-term planning. My question was really about where we have areas where we've clearly passed the tipping point. There's just already too much for the uh, services to absorb. Um, is there a point at which um, we can say we're putting a freeze on because some of these things to build school capacity, to build childcare capacity, um, it takes years. Mm -hmm. um, so at what point can we say um, we're, yes, we will approve your development if it conforms to the official plan, but we're putting a hold on it because the area could not absorb anymore. Does the new, does the new planning regime give us the ability to do that? Not, not in the sense of a global freeze, but we've, we've always had the ability to use the holding provisions of the Planning Act. Uh, we, um, we have used th those provisions in the waterfront, for example, where we don't have the infrastructure. Uh, they're in place in Regent Park. As Regent Park goes through various phases, the holds get released as we get the infrastructure answers uh, resolved. Uh, the approach has been used even in Young and Eglinton. So uh, I think we're going to increasingly see that as a tool so that we moderate the pace of growth and uh, to your point, uh, make sure that we've done uh, the infrastructure planning, which does, can take years, uh, uh, more in advance with the agencies that are responsible for that infrastructure. So, so I have one council meeting left. How do I ensure that this happens in North York? In North York Centre. Yes, North York Centre. Well, I, th I think the, the, um, the baseline condition for North York Centre, uh, and you, you know, you've experienced it. I respect the fact that you've experienced it for a number of years, and Councillor Shiner. So, uh, 
you may well know better than I about what those pressures are, but I would, I would say that we need a good baseline assessment of where we are with the growth and where we are with the provision of infrastructure from a data point of view so it's defensible if we chose to start using holds. And then we undertake a review of the plan so that we are in a better position going forward to uh, approve or not approve development and have a much clearer idea of what new infrastructure gets, needs to get developed to support the next tranche of growth that one could forecast for the soft sites that are up in North York Centre. Eventually it will be built out, but I would imagine there are a number of soft sites that are, uh, that are still uh, in the offing. Okay, I won't ask any more about that now, but I would like to discuss it further in the next week or so. Fair enough. So, we don't have any oh, Council Campbell questions. So I'd like to just follow up on that. Um, so, wh wh how, what criteria, well, I know it, it has to do with infrastructure, um, how, many, how many elements of criteria have to be in place for a hold to be issued? Uh, generally speaking, your, the whole provisions relate to, uh, through the Planning Act and our official plan, can relate to a number of matters. Um, uh, generally speaking, hard and soft infrastructure or, or other matters that, that um, support, are necessary to support the development. So you can establish the principle of development through the zoning bylaw amendment and then you, you put an H on it and until and if those matters are, uh, are in place and council satisfied, um, you, you cannot utilize that right. zoning permit. And if, if a hold is put in place, what... Um, and it's, sorry, it's usually done on a, on, a, on, a, on a master plan area basis or a, uh, a site-specific basis. So if, if a hold is put in place, what recourse then does a developer have to overturn it? Do they, do they go through the courts? Do they go to, through you know, the, the LPAT? Or how, 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 can, how would they fight a, a hold? Well, I, I don't know that... I mean, our experience has been that we would adopt a zoning bylaw amendment, for example, in Regent Park, the area that hasn't been developed has a zoning bylaw amendment with permission, but an H attached to it. Mm -hmm. And then as we come to that next phase, we ask the developer to provide us with an update on the provision of infrastructure. Mm -hmm. And if we can give advice to council that all of that infrastructure is in place or it's going to be provided in a reasonable way, then we give advice to council to release the hold. So, so the, the applicant can debate that, but it, it, mm -hmm. it comes down to, uh, what metrics and data points you've got and, and what grounds they've got to, uh, to object to the use of that, that device. It, it can get quite specific, which I think is beneficial for both sides because mm -hmm. you know what you're dealing with. So uh, the TTC is infrastructure. Uh, could Councillor Fillion argue that there should be no more development in the North York Centre because people can't get on the subway? Well, I think that's, that's certainly one area that we, we haven't broached with the use of, of holes, and that's a much, I think, a much bigger decision because, as Councillor Fillion noted, it's a longer term mm -hmm. need. Uh, we've got strateg strategies um, that are ongoing and evolutionary with building up uh, ridership capacity mm -hmm. in these areas. Um, but uh, we have yet to, to reach a point where we, we've, you know, as a council or as staff, we've, um, we have yet to reach a point where we're willing quite honestly, to stand up and say no more development because right. of you can't, because you can't get on the TDC. So I'm just going to change uh, uh, approaches and on, on another topic. The, uh, the province brought in a tax on foreign ownership, uh, foreign ownership purchases of, of, of uh, real estate. Um, do we keep track of foreign ownership of all of these units that have, been that have been developed and purchased in the last, like, do we have a means by which we keep track of foreign ownership? I don't believe we do. Chair, city just planning does not. Um, I don't believe that anybody maintains that information. I, I can just, there is some private sector work that's been done in trying to track foreign ownership. It's not fully comprehensive, but we could get you that if you. I don't. No, I don't need it. I just wanted to know because I, I was wondering if we if we could if we we don't do that basically. No. We don't we don't we don't know how many of these are units are bought on speculation or how many are being bought and, and, and purchased by, you know, end users. We don't have that kind of information. Okay, that's just my question. Thank you. Are there any other questions of staff? So then are there speakers on the item? Oh. 
My apologies. That's um, so I, I, I find this stuff useful, but what I, uh, there's a piece of it I don't see, which is uh, uh, how much, how many units do we have that uh, are affordable using the different metrics that we use, right? Because there's the 30% the and the 50%. Do we, does that get reported somewhere else or? I believe we, I mean, the, the, uh, the essence of this report is admittedly high level. It doesn't yeah. go down to the next level of, okay. of different data points, but completely legitimate question. And I'm looking at the staff. I mean, we, we, we report through overall on, uh, on the housing or the affordable housing committee on production. But you, you're looking for a more global picture of yeah, where so we are on the affordable housing. I, I can tell you how many units that we approve through an affordable housing project. That right. number I know. You want what I them. don't know is what the supply, uh, public, private, the whole market supply of affordable housing when, is. Does with, anyone with know that? With respect to the inclusionary zoning um, powers and bringing forward an official See, I don't amendment. think that's going to help with No, that, no, but. no, no. But I'm going to say... In order to do that, the regulations require a housing needs assessment. So we are embarking on that, and Carrie can explain how that process will probably reveal the snapshot that I'm you need. Through the chair, just answered the first question. What we do keep track of is how many rental replacements when we have demolitions. That we keep track of, but we don't keep track of the additional information you're asking. I think on a go-forward basis, certainly it's a priority to the city, the entire spectrum of housing, and we've been working with other divisions to have a, I'd say, more fulsome and representative picture so that as we report out to council, you have a better understanding of you know, the size of units, the breakdown in terms of affordable ownership, uh, rental, but we don't have such a report to date. Yeah, okay, So, but we're going to need to pre prepare that to be eligible for the IZ if it actually happens. With respect to the IZ, there is a tremendous amount of background in supporting documentation mm -hmm. that's required, and that's what we're currently pulling together to determine what do we, what do we have internally, what can we obtain from our colleagues and what do we need to co hire a consultant to gather information for us. Thank you. Sorry. So in following up on that, I guess to you, Greg, if we asked and decided to send this to council, to try and bring the matters to greater attention of council and asked for the number of units constructed over uh, the last uh, 10 years. If we looked for then the number of those that were rental or ownership, and if we then look to see the number of units that are still approved, not constructed, under construction, under review, and then we asked to give us into those breakdowns the number of affordable housing units on a yearly basis. No, but I'd like to see the number of affordable housing units that we've approved on a yearly basis, the number of affordable housing units that are in the applications that are here. And if I wrote that out properly. Is that information that you have and you could provide to us? I see a slight look of concern <laughs> on, uh, <laughs> on Terry's face. Well, like, I'm, I'm trying oh. so, <laughs> and, and if not, if not that, what I'm trying to do is to get a snapshot over a about ten year period of what's been built, and of that, how much rental, and how much ownership, and how much affordable because that's the picture that keeps running around. So I was just choosing some categories here. If not that, is there information that you could provide similar to that? That is data that we currently have without having to create new data. So in tr through the chair, th we can get the number of units constructed because we would work with our colleagues in Bil Toronto buildings to obtain that information. 
the breakdown of affordable um, and rental will be the challenge because we don't maintain stats on market rental. Okay. So the number of units constructed you could deal with. Correct. And then the number of units that are in the approved, not built, under approval, or uh, applications are in under review, you can provide. Correct. And then the number of affordable housing units is available from the affordable housing office, is it not? We can obtain the information that our colleagues in the affordable housing office has. But so if, I, if, if I move to simple motion that said to ask you to send this to council and ask that you give us a snapshot of the number of the units that have been constructed or are to be constructed, making it simple in the city, uh, and also the number of affordable housing units that have been constructed over a 10 year period, then you could put something together? That we can do, a snapshot, but it'll be a high level, but we can do that. So that was a question. It's not a motion yet. Councillor Perks, you have a question or a sigh of something. Well, I. I'm trying to. Yeah, I understand what you're trying to do, Mr. Chair. I just. If you have a better I have, suggestion. I have a worry. So we get these reports uh, all the time about how many units of affordable housing we have constructed. What that, that, and that gives an impression that we're somehow making things better. I would contend that the number of private market affordable units that I have seen disappear from affordability in Parkdale alone is larger than the number of affordable units that we have built citywide. So when we get these reports saying we built X, Y, and Z, it gives people the impression that somehow we're getting, you know, we're trending in the right direction on affordable housing. Without the information about what the overall market looks like for affordable housing, it's actually misleading to get reports talking about what we've built. And I, I, you know, I, so I, I empathize with the staff seeing as here. we're doing questions, so is there a way to ascertain the number of units that were lost? Well, short of providing Kerry with a big whack of consulting money, I can't, like, off the top of my head, I don't know how to do it. No. There. Okay, so we're leaving it go. Are there speakers on the item? Are there speakers on the item? So, Councillor Fillion to speak, and then I'll speak after and we'll deal with it. Um, and it's just uh, taking this suggestion to review and update the uh, table if required. Okay. Did you want to speak any further to the item? Are you okay? No, no, that's good. Councillor Perks, did you want to, Councillor Perks? Did you want to speak? Did you want to speak on this item? No, this is Councillor Fillion's motion. He's putting it. Do you want to speak on the item that's in front of us? So, do you want to speak now? Oh, lots of us will tell you what you should say, but that probably won't help. That's Councillor Fillion's motion. He just tabled it, which we're all fine with. Do you want to move a motion? I'll speak to kill time then. If so, else wants to. if you want, I'll, I was going to speak as well, and I can do that while you're then right, you can Councillor speak Perks. To kill time, yeah. Councillor DiCiano, did you guys want to speak at all, or not on no, this? We're good. So, if I if I could just give. So, if I could make some comments on this. Um, I, I find these charts and graphs very scary. 
I do that because I see a concentration of residential development in a few pockets and along some of the existing public transportation corridors. And I don't see it in all the outreaches where many of our colleagues in Scarborough and Etobicoke and others say, we could use some intensification. And they're not talking about 30, 40, 50 story buildings necessarily. They're talking about intensification and rejuvenation of the areas and there's a mismatch. We have a new planning framework and new responsibilities with changes to the act where we might be able to start to move this around. And we also have a review of the development process which is ongoing which might help us do that to understand where it is, what we want, and how you encourage development in different parts of the city. But I find scary how many new units are being built in the city without any major infrastructure improvements. It's what we hear on a constant basis from the people that we represent across the city. Where is that infrastructure? Number one, where's public transit? Are you gonna move people? Because you got two subway lines and a little stubway up in Shepherd, which has to be completed and nothing much else that's in place. And even what's going in on Eglinton Avenue is not a subway. It's, a, it's, it's an LRT. It's rapid transit, but it's not a subway line. It, does, it doesn't have the capacity of that. And the questions you all raise, where is the infrastructure, the transportation infrastructure, the parks infrastructure, the school infrastructure, the hospitals, the water wastewater infrastructure, the childcare, hydro, it comes up on every single development that's going in. People ask the same questions. And those maps scare me. Because if you try to get around the city now, you see what's already happening in so many areas where development has honed in to deal with the demand that's there in areas that are the most attractive to build in. And then the issue is the land's gotten so expensive we can't build affordable housing, which we haven't done a lot of. And to take that in place of the infrastructure numbers, I have information that was given to me by the finance department and in a four-year period, in a four-year period from 2012 to 2016, provincial sales and income taxes off of new developments in the City of Toronto alone is estimated to be $2.7 billion. Four years. Federal sales and income tax, 3.7 billion dollars. If you add that together, your $6.4 billion in revenue off of all the new development that's occurred within Toronto that went to the other two levels of government and was not invested back into the infrastructure for schools, for childcare, for transit. This city has supported both the federal and the provincial budgets year after year after year from the revenue from new construction that hasn't come back to build the infrastructure that's necessary. And yes, the city got money. What we got was an additional tax, property taxes, $235 million. What are you gonna do in comparison with $235 million in extra revenue over a four year period? Over a billion dollars a year, over a billion dollars a year is flowing out of the city to the provincial and the federal governments, and that has to stop. And we have to find a way to bring that back in, and we also have to find a way to control the development until it comes back in to keep this a livable city that people like to be in. I mean, we, we do great jobs in managing what we have and the pressures that we have, but we are not the captain of the ship at this point in time, deciding how we go and, and where we are. Our course is being charted by others that aren't investing in us, and I think that has to change. So it's not in any way anything negative about our staff and the work we've done. I think you're doing a fantastic job. It is the process that's incurred and what we hear time after time from the residents and the city, and we hear it from our colleagues, and you raised it here again today, where's the affordable housing, where's the infrastructure, where's the school, where are the childcare, where's the transportation? And I don't think that the city of Toronto can continue to take a blind eye to it and not continue to put more pressure than it has, not that we haven't tried, but more pressure with some statistical information that's important. 
as I said, $6.4 billion. So in a 10-year period, you're probably talking in the neighborhood of 12 to $15 billion that has come from development and much more is going to come that isn't getting reinvested and has to be reinvested. And somehow we have to turn that things in that direction. So that's my comment on this, how the city grows. Councillor Campbell. So uh, I wasn't going to say anything, but I will. And I know we're supposed to be strong advocates for the city. I, you could add to your tally the land transfer tax funds that flowed flow to the province, not just the sales taxes. But in fact, and I'm, I'm far be it for me to be an apologist for the former Liberal government, but money has flowed into the city in terms of uh, funding for transit, funding for childcare, funding for schools. The province introduced all day kindergarten. That, had a, that was a, a very significant expenditure on both the Catholic and public boards. They had to build, they had to build extra spaces for all those children. And so I think that if we're going to be credible, we have to make, when speaking to the provincial government, we have to acknowledge that some of those investments have been made. They may not have been made to the extent that we wish they had been made. They certainly haven't been made on the affordable housing front, as, as we would all acknowledge, but some investments have been made. Where's my colleague? Oh, there he is, Councillor Perks. Um, so I think I have a motion ready, yeah? So it, it's very simply um, to ask the chief planner to go to CMHC and give us some real data on affordability in Toronto and some trend data. Uh, report which, it where? Hmm? And report it with the next report coming here? Or I, uh, I, once they start to collect it, it can become part of the regular reporting. I, this is going to take a little while to get to get organized, so I'm not excited about the possibility of it being here for January, but I think that we need to start making it clear to CMHC we need this data so that when we get these reports, um, there's, a, there's always a line in these reports or in other uh, things the planning department tells me, which is that, you know, we're building out our supply as fast as the growth plan needs us to, and we're balancing, you know, we're, we're providing adequate supply, housing supply. But that always begs the question for whom. Uh, there's a social service agency in, in my ward uh, when, who try to tries to provide assistance to people. And now when people come to them there's, and saying, you know, I'm having trouble with my housing, they're advising people to move to Guelph or Kitchener, Waterloo or Hamilton. They're saying it's just impossible here. And Although it looks like we're building and building and building, we're building for certain people and not for others. And we're actually squeezing certain people out of the city of Toronto. They're being forced to leave. And it's something we need better data on. And simply claiming that we have this program or that incentive or whatever without a proper sense of what's happening in the marketplace for that sec sector of the marketplace um, we we're throwing darts blindly with our affordable housing programs if we don't have proper context. Uh, and I think we also have to make it clear to the federal government that they have a duty. It's actually within the mandate of CMHC not only to, to provide money but to, to have this data available. It's, a, it's something they used to do. It was routine. And it, for some reason, CMHC seems to think that nowadays, what was it? They have half a trillion dollars in private mortgages that they've underwritten. So, you know, they're actually putting their foot on the gas of getting private ownership built. And they pretty much walked away from their responsibility to the rental market. And I think by beginning with asking the question, we can put them on notice. We need a real return to a commitment to the, the rental side of the housing market from CMHC. And, you know, the, the remarks of uh, Councillor Campbell, I think, were, were absolutely dead on. While we have got some federal, some federal and provincial funding for some things, I mean, you know, you just have to announce you want to build a subway somewhere and all of a sudden there's money flowing at you. Uh, both of those orders of government have failed dramatically on the housing front, despite the 
you know, the claims made about there being a national housing strategy. Well, no, there isn't. There will be one maybe in five years if you look at the way it's structured. We have to get ahead of it. We have to get ahead of it now. And getting CMHC to provide us with the information is, is a first step. We have then two motions, and then we have a motion to receive the report. Am I? We're amending it. Mm -hmm. So on the motion by Councillor Fillion, all those in favor? Any opposed? That's carried. On the motion by Councillor Perks, all those in favor? Any opposed? That's carried. We are done. Now we have 31.3, which is a 1015 public hearing. Is there any? I don't have any listed speakers. Are there any? Are there anyone here that wanted to speak to 3501, 3621, 3623, 3639 Dufferin Street, and 719, 721, 725 Wilson Avenue, City Initiated Zoning Bylaw Amendment and Results of Interim Control Bylaw Study, the final report? Questions. If there are no speakers, so we'll take it into committee. Uh, Councillor Campbell. Uh, yeah. The um, this is the one where the regeneration study was done. I think. Uh, oh, the chief planner's gone. Sorry. Oh, he's behind. Oh, sorry. Uh, this is the this is the the Dufferin area where the uh, regeneration study was done. Is that correct? Um, through you, uh, Mr. Chair. That's correct. The uh, regeneration study was approved uh, through this committee last December through OPA 362. And this report before you is a zoning bylaw amendment to permanently delete some uses uh, from the zoning bylaw that were um, suspended through an interim control bylaw. Right. That interim control bylaw expires next January. So this report basically uh, deletes those uses before the so interim control bylaw expires. That's why, yeah, and that, that's where I, I just want to ask, um, you know, some questions why why we did that. I think it was automobile servicing, car washes, uh, things of that nature were, were, were taken out of, were, were, were Cor meant to Correct. be excluded. We, we did it for two primary reasons. Number one is through the regeneration study, we changed this area from employment to mixed use areas. It's adjacent to a subway station, Wilson, which is very close by. And primarily, we're setting the groundwork for the revitalization of the area and the intensification of the area into a more mixed-use, compact form of development. So we're taking out these uses because they're very land consumptive, uh, they're auto-related, require a lot of surface parking, and don't usually have high employment uh, and um, residential types of uses. Secondly, we're taking them out because some of them, like manufacturing or auto repair service, are not conducive or compatible with the uses that we're going to be introducing, which are residential. So I guess the last, listen, I just want to know, were there, were there any, are there any businesses that are, are, be, are displaced or that are, are going to be forced to, to vacate the area or uh, what, what was the current? No one's being forced to vacate the area. There's just um, a couple of uses, uh, for example, the gas station on the corner, on the southeast uh, corner would become legal non-conforming, but they can continue to exist. Was there anything else in the area, or is that it? Um, I believe so. That's because no, as I look at yeah. it, just it's mostly vacant land. It's vacant land. There's an office right. building that can continue to exist in, right. uh, in with permissions. Okay, okay, that's it, Mr. Chair. I don't have any further questions. All right. Are there any other questions of committee members? Then, Councilor Campbell, are you moving the recommendation? I'll move the recommendation. Recommendations are moved on PG 31.3. All those in favor? Any opposed? That's carried. PG 31.4, second units OPA. I also don't have any speakers listed on it. It was a timed item for 10.30. Is there anyone here that did want to speak to it? If not, um, the planning, of, I've been asked to read this out. The Planning Growth Management Committee is holding a statutory special public meeting in accordance with Section 26 of the Planning Act for item PG 31.4, second units, official plan amendment, final report recommendation. Any questions of staff then? There's no speakers. Is there a mover of the staff recommendations? 
Is there anyone that would like to move the staff recommendations of 31.4? Councillor DiCiano. All those in favor? Any opposed? That's carried. Moving right along now. Did they come and talk to you about this? Did Mike Williams come and talk to you about I'm yeah, good with this? So Councillor Perks, PG 31.10, because we haven't come to the 11.15 yet, public hearing. You had questions or comments? That is the OP official plan review for the transport, proposed transportation policy directions for consultation? Um, by and large, I'm, I'm fine with it, uh, but, ha, ah, there we go. I was hoping to get this nice colored map, which has just arrived. This is 10? 31.10, opposed. So before we start with questions then, because we've just been handed a, a fully colored chart, maybe we can just ask staff to give us a very brief presentation of what the proposal is and what the map is, and maybe that'll answer some questions. Certainly, through the chair. Um, so what we are proposing is, uh, or, or we're looking for, uh, confirmation from committee to move ahead with consultations on the second half of the transportation policy review for the official plan. We, you may recall that in 2013 we began a process that at the time we called feeling congested, which was the first phase of the official plan review related to transportation policies. We received special permission from the Ministry of Municipal Affairs at the time to divide that review in two halves. And so we took forward the first half uh, and made a, an official plan amendment to incorporate a number of changes to the transportation policies in 2014. And now what we need to do is complete that review. There are four key outstanding issues that we need to deal with now. Uh, the first is to, uh, to deal with the, um, uh, the rapid transit, uh, the policies related to rapid transit and the, and the map, uh, as well as some of the, the policies related to um, surface, transit, uh, surface transit routes. We need to update the policy framework or introduce a policy framework for cycling. Uh, we need to update some of the street related maps and schedules. And then at this point, we're also looking for uh, to move ahead with a bit of a re um, consultation on whether and how we might address the issue of automated vehicles and other emerging technologies in the OP, uh, shared mobility services, whether that's even something we need to do, but we, we want to include that as part of the consultations. So the report before you outlines a bit of information about each of those four areas, and, uh, and uh, we would be launching a process uh, an internal process and then moving out in the fall to consultations with stakeholders in the community and uh, we'll be reporting back in uh, to PGM and to council in uh, toward the end of Q1 of 2019 with um, with proposed amendments to the official plan thank you are there questions of staff Councillor Perks, did you have questions? Yes. Um, so, first, uh, the thank you for the coloured version of the the map. The black and white didn't really give me any information. So, I'm looking at attachment three, the proposed draft higher order transit network, and I'm just trying to remember. Um, part M, the Eglinton East LRT, is listed as unfunded. Didn't council decide that the Eglinton East piece and the Scarborough subway piece were bundled within the same funding envelope? Uh, through the chair, the Eglinton East LRT project was presented as part of the Scarborough Transit Network. Yes. And council approved some funding for us to take that project through to uh, a higher level of design. 
in order to get it ready for, um, for uh, procurement and construction, but we do not yet have uh, funding secured for the, the uh, confirmed for the construction of that. The project has also been identified as one of, uh, one of the, the number of priorities for the next phase of uh, federal funding, and that will need to be uh, reconfirmed by council as we learn more about how that project or program will unfold. See, I, I maybe, maybe my memory is starting to fail with age, but I, I'm pretty sure that at some point council got a report saying that if we eliminate two subway stops on the Bloor Danforth extension, we can therefore afford the Eglinton East LRT. I see Councillor DiCiano nodding, so either he and I are both misremembering. Wasn't that, wasn't that what Council was told? So through the Chair, the Scarborough Transit Network presented the, the notion of uh, uh, an order of magnitude cost for uh, this project fitting in with um, the differential between doing a full three-stop subway and doing the express subway. However, at that time, there was no decision by council to, uh, to take it through to, to full uh, construction. What we have is, uh, through the stage gate process that we have been going through, funding and approval to move to the next stage, and so that's what we are doing. So if I were just some interested observer out there who's been following the news and had read that we were getting a one-stop subway plus an LRT extension, this map shows me that no, we're just getting the one sub subway extension and maybe someday there will be funding for the LRT in Scarborough. That's what this map tells me. This map is presenting the, uh, the, current, uh, the current state of, of commitments and direction from Council. I guess you're just not going to repeat my rhetoric back to me, eh? <laughs> no. Um, the, I tried hard. <laughs> um, the a thing I found interesting in this is uh, showing the, uh, the attachment four, the draft enhancements to the surface transit network. And I, 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 that one delighted me because, as I think it says somewhere in, in here, the surface transit network is actually the workhorse. It's not the things you get to cut ribbons for that deliver people. It's actually the buses and streetcars that run every day. Um, so are you looking at putting something in the official plan that acknowledges the role of the surface transit network? Is that what you're going to be consulting on? Certainly that would, uh, that, um, would be part of the, the policy framework that we'd want to include. So I guess maybe my next question then, I'm not sure who to ask. So we, we have an... Uh, when in the official plan, it's hard to, it's easy to imagine. You put something in the official plan, it's a line on the map, we're gonna build it someday, you protect for it, and, and there you go. What I don't understand is every year when we come to our budget deliberations and there's the question of the operating subsidy for the surface transit network, how does the official plan relate to that? Does this just give us some guidance for the TTC about how they should invest or I, I just, maybe Mr. DiGeronimo, he's used to complicated questions. Uh, uh, Thierry, Mr. Chair, I, actually, I, I think what you articulate is the reason why we're bringing the, trans, uh, uh, the transportation uh, policy update uh, is to make sure the official plan has uh, better language in it. Yeah. Um, and, and then we can start using that when we're informing council on budget requests. Because at, at this point in time, there are some disconnects between what's in the official plan, and all the various plans that are developed separately, the transit plan, um, you know, operating plans, capital plans for various divisions. Uh, the intention of this is, is to complete a detailed review, embed it into the official plan, and then that becomes kind of a, the, the touchstone vision that we can refer to in all subsequent budget deliberations. Okay, and finally, um, I see, uh, some conversation here about cycling and I think two or three sentences about pedestrianism. Um, so we'll, I, I found that actually thinner than I would have liked. Given the recent uh, decisions by council around Vision Zero, 
will the consultations uh, on the transportation network foreground the, the issue of making uh, walking and cycling safer in the City of Toronto as an official plan policy? Through the Chair, certainly that is, um, as, as the Deputy City Manager uh, noted, we want to make sure that all of the operational plans, Vision Zero, the cycling strategy, other operational plans on the transportation side link into the official plan and, and creating a, a, safe, um, a safe system for pedestrians, for cyclists, for all users of the road is, is an important policy direction. We will, um, uh, I'm sure, need to bring in to our conversations with stakeholders and uh, the community at large uh, information and what we're doing on, on road safety. Um, that, uh, that will need to be a key part of our conversations. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, just to elaborate, Transportation Services is working closely with city planning on completing this exercise. So some of those objectives that Council has put forward to them would be part of that exercise. Are there other questions of staff? So I do have one. Mr. DiGeronimo? Yes. This is our dream? The map here? This is the, uh, Mr. Chair, this would be the, the dream that we would go out and consult the public with and get feedback from them. That, that's essentially what we want to start doing and then bringing back forward to you um, what we heard from the public and, and get council to endorse that and put it in the official plan. But this is the dream for the transit network? At, at this point in time, this is what we want to bring out and, and, and have people consult with. So it's, it's, it shows what's approved, what we have in mind, the, un, the unfunded, and then as well, we will go out and, and get feedback on. Is there a estimated cost? Uh, no, I, I don't believe we have all items costed at this point in time, uh, James. Uh, no, we don't have an accurate cost on all of those. Some of them have had no, um, uh, no degree of, of, of rigor or analysis applied to them yet. They're, they're ideas that have been raised and to add to the Deputy City, city Managers, this map also uh, includes those lines that councillors, the Council has asked us to consider, the extension of Finch to the airport. Uh, uh, other other lines that over the past few years, uh, council has asked us, to, asked us to add to the mix, but we do not have full costing on all of them. It would be billions, many many billions of dollars. I know. I was wondering how many minis. Uh, then you have a number of lines that are either up along Steeles Avenue or on the east and the west and the north proceed out of the city. What is the plan to work with our neighbours in the 905 region in regards to our dream meeting into their dream because we share the traffic and the frustrations uh, of lack of public transit in all the areas? So we um, already are working very closely through Metrolinks primarily with neighboring municipalities, with Mississauga, with York, with Durham, uh, on a number, of, a number of projects that are lines that you see on that map. Um, but there continue, to, I think the, the number of transit projects that cross the line uh, continue to, to grow um, and, and the demands for improved traffic across the boundaries of the City of Toronto, I think, um, will will increase. And so uh, Metrolinx has been playing a, a coordinating role on things like the Durham BRT, the Durham Scarborough BRT, on, on some projects that Mississauga is wanting to undertake along Dundas into Kipling, and then certainly the Young Subway extension up into Richmond Hill. And, and I expect that will probably be how those continue to um, unfold in the future. I would, I would just add, Mr. Chair, that the plan, our official plan should reflect the regional transportation plan. So Metro plan, Met, Metrolinx approved its plan this spring. So this is an exercise for us to bring our official plan into conformity with their long-term vision. So those interjurisdictional lines get reflected both on our mapping and on Metrolinx's documents. Which ones did Metrolinx include? Just the goal lines? 
No, I think uh, no. It's, it's it's all in in the in terms I've, of higher order buses transit. Have the, the map. It's so they, but the, they, it was not just the go lines. It was some of the lines that I mentioned. So the Young Subway extension uh, up uh, Young Street to Richmond Hill. It included the Durham Scarborough BRT, the Dundas um, BRT project that Mississauga has been championing, the Eglinton West extension to the airport, uh, Finch extension to the airport, and and a number of others. Uh, but the, the, there is a, a fairly significant list of. Uh, of projects aimed at 2041, so they're not all happening now. Just, just to add that, so our discussions with Metrolinx have been evolving to be more than just the traditional GO service, including bus service, et cetera, so it's, it's a broader range of It's bus service and it's extension of the Young Subway. Is it anything beyond that? At this point in time, no, uh, but the, the committees are being set up uh, amongst Metrolinx, the cities, and the province on having uh, inter-regional discussions. So then, I guess, and just trying to understand it, under the current provincial model, when Metrolinx was initially created, it was to coordinate the public transit initiatives throughout the southern Ontario area, you know, the greater Ho Golden Horseshoe. It's now operating some of the lines. But is it still the agency that the province is depending upon for the recommendations for plans as they go forward, because some of ours are not bus rapid transit, they are LRT lines and others, and are they still continuing to be the agency that the province depends upon and we need their support of? Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, at this point in time, yes. They are, they are still the entity that, that we engage uh, on transit, but, but also involves uh, uh, the Ministry of Transportation. They're, they're at the table as well. So you have the ministry, the provincial ministry, along with Metrolinx as the operating agency. Okay, thank you. Are there, oh, Councillor Campbell, questions? Sure, the question's for Mr. Pertle. In, 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 in my view, the, the, major, the major miss from a transit standpoint is that there is no continuous east-west route other than Bloor Danforth. And I'm just wondering if you could, if you could, if you could, um, offer an opinion as to why there's nothing that mirrors the route that, that most of the cars in Toronto take, which is along the 401, which is the east-west route. We have all these little lines that may be something one day, but there's nothing designed to get people from Etobicoke to Scarborough across the top of the city or from Scarborough to, to Etobicoke. Through, uh, through the chair, um, I think uh, that it's important that we be building out the network, as, as you indicate, uh, across east-west as well as various routes north-south to build out a grid. And that's some of what we've been trying to do. Certainly the extensions to Eglinton will do some of what you're talking about. Um, the, uh, the, the Shepherd line, uh, while it may be a couple of different technologies uh, in the future, um, would also provide that connection, but I take your point. There are some. Uh, there's. There's not one other long east-west line that goes from one end to the other. Uh, part of what we look at, though, in, in thinking about the network, is is where are the pockets of growth? How do we best serve those and provide options to people, uh, and a grid that that gives people more um, more choices. Okay. So are there uh, any other questions? Not seeing any. Are there any speakers? Councillor Campbell. So I'll just uh, very quickly. Um, this, the, I, I, I don't understand why Metrolinx uh, has not thought about that east-west route. Uh, that is the most heavily traveled highway in in North America. Or certainly, it's, it's the most heavily traveled highway in in, in Canada. And there's no way for people to take mass transit from east to west. And it would seem that you would want a connector in the east to take you south, and in the, in the west to take you south and north, and then one across the top, which, which would replicate the 401. I'm sure that, I'm sure that uh, transit watchers and anybody that's making a commute would welcome the elimination of lanes on the 401 if it really meant the elimination of many, many cars so that people could actually get around the city more readily. Um, in terms of the in terms of the plan that's in front of us, I just had a, you know had a brief conversation with the chief planner, and one of the things that I've asked for and that I would like to see 
is I would like to see City Council actually set priorities on which transit lines are most important. We talk about the downtown relief line and there's a general sort of acceptance that that's the number one priority, but then other people might think it's the waterfront transit that's more necessary. Somebody else may say that it's, it, you know, it's, it's the Shepherd line. We know that they're doing Finch, we know that they're doing Shepherd, that's in the plan. But we as a city council, there are, there are an, an innumerable number of transit projects here and we've never really sat down and said as a council and debated which are the priorities. And, and I think that that's something that the next council should, should do. And I hope at some point there's some, there are some options presented to us on how we will uh, proceed going forward and how we'll lobby the federal and provincial governments for specific projects. Thank you. Councillor Perks, were you looking to speak on this? There's been so much wisdom I don't need to. So I, I will comment briefly. So I'll refer back to how does the city grow and look at what this map does and what isn't on the map where the city grows. And I think that the requirement to build many of these lines, whether they're LRTs, BRTs, or in some ways, uh, accepting the comment that Councillor Campbell has said, other mass rapid transit routes that may follow either designated routes or add to areas where Shepherd is a major corridor just north of the 401 that might work. But in the past, I've always... I need a colleague back in the room. I'm missing a colleague, so I have to stop. Uh, I will make my comments as we continue, but we can't really go on with the meeting unless Councillor Fillion and or Councillor DiCiano returns to the room. So if Councillor Fillion or Councillor DiCiano are within hearing room where you can hear us there, we have one. Councillor Fillion's back, thank you. So in, in saying that, uh, the city's been growing and I've always heard, well, we'll put the transit in to support the growth. The question is, should the transit go in before the growth and the growth support the transit? because the maps that we had previously show, showed us that growth does follow the transit lines and it, you do create the growth along those lines and that's where the major growth in the city has been. And as Councillor Fillion has experienced, North York Center grew substantially after the North York Center stop was put in. There was formerly a stop at Shepherd and a stop at Finch and then the stop became in the middle. The Shepherd Avenue East grew where the subway line was put in and continues to grow. And while it's not as heavily used as people would like, it's not a very long subway right now, but there is tremendous growth along those corridors. And we see growth now being uh, and occurring along Eggington Avenue where a new transit line is going in. So uh, I think that we really do need to start to build, and I think we all do better public transit throughout the entire city, to be able to move the intensification around the entire city and the people that come with it that way. And I think we have to do a better job uh, with our friends at Metrolinx to give us more support to build the transit networks that we really need throughout the city and interconnecting links that go outside of the city because it doesn't take a transportation expert to figure out what we currently have isn't working. Otherwise, I have no other comments. Are there any motions on this one? So it's a motion just to receive? To adopt? So there's a motion to adopt, moved by Councillor Campbell. All those in favor? Any opposed? That's carried. So now we have Item number five at 11.15, Community Improvement Plan to implement
changes to the imagination, manufacturing, innovation, and technology uh, program. We have some public speakers on that. I have, first of all, Mohammed Hashim from Toronto, New York Region Labour Council. Mohammed. And after that, I have Derek Goring from First Gulf and Paul Scrivener. So those of you that haven't been here before and will have speakers after, you have five minutes. We run the clocks. Please stop within that so we don't have to stop you and make us really interested in what you have to say. If there are questions, we will ask you questions after. Please go ahead, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Mohammed Hashim. I am the senior organizer for the Toronto York Region Labour Council. I just want to thank the chair for giving us the opportunity to present our deputation. Um, I want to thank city staff, uh, particularly Mike Williams, for the great work that he's done putting this together, and, work, and his staff working with us for the last uh, number of months and over a year on our uh, work to try to improve this program. So the Toronto York Region Labour Council represents 208,000 women uh, and men who work in every sector of, of Toronto's economy. Our council and its affiliates have been deeply involved in the issues of economic development and employment lands for many decades. In the past, we have uh, in, we helped initiate the Green Economic Development Strategy. We're engaged in the Task Force on Economic Competitiveness and have been involved in citywide consultations and local efforts around the employment lands in the Portlands, Western Mount Dennis, the Studio District, South Etobicoke, and Rexdale. Uh, the Labour Council has been keenly interested in the development of the IMIT program since it was initially presented to the City's Economic and Development Committee over a decade ago. In the last year, we have, we have made submissions and deputations to committees and have discussed the program with staff and multiple city divisions. Uh, and, but the crux of the matter for the Labour Council is, is always fourfold. The program should be focused on key industries and sectors that need development support. So i.e. sectors that are important to the city but which struggle in the current economic um, environment. Manufacturing, the green economy, um, uh, like the, uh, the arts and cultural uh, industry, those are, those are all industries that have, have historically, well, currently been struggling, and this is an opportunity for us to invest in those industries to, to help them uh, lift higher. The emphasis should be on the creation of good jobs, uh, and the process of decisions should be transparent and accountable to City Council. Um, and the mm -hmm. amount of grants paid out should be curtailed um, to leave revenue room to, for, to fund our essential city programs and services. So the, of the four uh, pieces that, that we had, uh, the first one that, that I wanted to quickly is, just talk about is, 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 the, is the environment of, of economic growth. We, we are supportive of the program. We are supportive of the changes that uh, city staff are, are, have made. But we, are also, but we also think that they're not going far enough. There's an opportunity here that we can really just tweak things small uh, in order to really focus them and to, be, to make them more helpful in industries that really deserve a little bit of help from, from city council. Um, and, some, and some of those industries uh, would be, you know, so the, like the manufacturing, food and beverage wholesale, uh, the film studios, and particularly uh, the green economy. We feel that the city council has a role in furthering the, uh, the goals of Transform TO and investing in industries, particularly around sustainable development, that we can uh, use investment for and become a global leader in. The second thing is around transparency. Currently, the process for, for, for approval on, on these is that not, like some of it is, developed, is, is approved just straight by city staff, and some of it is um, approved by city council. We think all decisions of this magnitude should be brought to city council, because this is a significant amount of money that we're spending towards uh, helping industries, and if the city is going to be making uh, that big an investment, which could over the next you know, 20, 30 years, be something like you know half a billion dollars according to like the the city's own projections. So we want to be able to create a level of transparency and accountability, uh, and be, and those decisions to be guided by the wisdom of city council um, and our councillors. Um, the third thing uh, that we are really keenly uh, like particular about is on jobs. We don't know exactly what jobs are created, how many jobs are created, are they good stable jobs, are they sustainable jobs, are they, uh, like, and any metrics around that? Because 
and the application process of this program, our understanding is that the, the, the burden to be able to provide that information uh, is not, uh, is not as, as heavy as we should have. And we really need to have good data that provides us intelligence to say, how, do, how, do we, how are these investments actually increasing uh, job growth and economic development? And I think that there needs to be really more deeper data around figuring that out in order for us to have um, a better sense of what to approve and what not to approve. And the last thing, um, and I realize I have 10 seconds, is um, just around how much money are we actually spending and is this the best use of our funds? Um, and if, if we are to be looking at this as, as a whole, uh, how much money, like it's going to be half a billion dollars over the next, next while, we've already approved projects worth more than half a billion dollars. Is, if, is, that, the, is that the amount that we need to be spending to in, uh, induce this economic growth or, is that, or are, there, are there other places that are more deserving? And I'll leave it at that if you have any questions. Thank you very much. Are there any questions from visiting councillors? Any questions from committee members? Okay, thank you very much for your deputation this morning. Thank you. We're going to now move to Derek Goring from, from First Gulf Corporation. Good morning, uh, Derek. You've got uh, five minutes. Start any time. Good morning, Mr. Chair and committee members, and thank you for the opportunity to speak today. My name is Derek Goring, and I'm the Vice President of Development at First Gulf Corporation, and I lead the East Harbor Project. Our CEO, David Jarofsky, was unavailable to attend this today, but he submitted a letter to this committee on this matter. East Harbor is a major transit-oriented employment hub to be de developed on the former Unilever site in accordance with a secondary plan and rezoning unanimously approved by Toronto City Council last week and by this committee a couple of weeks before that. East Harbor will transform underutilized and disconnected brand, brownfield lands into sustainable, vibrant workplace of the future, accommodating over 50,000 jobs and providing best-in-class space for a range of industry sectors. It will also deliver a substantial package of community benefits, transit, and public realm improvements to, both, to serve both the new workers of East Harbor and the surrounding communities. Recent Council decisions establish East Harbour as a policy priority for accommodating long-term employment growth and providing the type of office space that is necessary to contribute to Toronto's global economic competitiveness. However, as part of the Queen Carla TIF zone, East Harbour is one of only two areas in the city that are recommended for the phase-out and elimination of the IMIT program. We are confident in the future of East Harbour. However, the area is currently underdeveloped industrial land and IMIT will be particularly important in the early years of its redevelopment. Unlike other areas of the city in which IMIT will continue to be available, East Harbour does not yet exist as an established district. If the development of East Harbour does not happen as quickly as we would all like, it will not deliver the tax revenue or the ridership that the Smart Track project is counting on. So we are requesting a delay in the phase out of the IMIT program for East Harbour to continue incentives comparable to what will be available elsewhere in the city and to help attract tenants until the district has matured into a successful new employment node. This would support the city's policy goal of East Harbour becoming a major commercial centre with a sufficient density of new employment uses to support new transit and contribute to the city's economic competitiveness. It would also accelerate the development of the district, thereby accelerating the generation of smart track ridership and incremental tax revenues. Given our most recent zoning approval, we are enthusiastic about advancing this project and moving ahead with implementation. The extension of IMIT eligibility would go a long way to support that goal. Thank you. Thank you very much. Are there any questions from visiting councillors? Any questions from committee members? Councillor Campbell. Uh, has First Gulf has received these funds already or to some degree? No. No, never, has never received these funds? Oh, for other projects yeah. we have, yes. In, in, that, in that area, in the Unilever area or? or? Uh, no, the, uh, the area where we've received the grants in the past are uh, King Street East. So okay. 333 King Street East where we attracted Coca-Cola Canada, uh, their headquarters, which would otherwise probably have left the city, okay. as well as the Globe and Mail building on King Street East. And, and again, that, the IMIT grant helped establish that area as a commercial node okay. where it wasn't before. And 
so you're asking for this to not apply to that area or to not be taken away from that area, the, the, the Unilever area? No. So as an example, King Street East would still be eligible right. based on the recommendations right. going forward. Okay. And, and how many millions would you say are at stake? Uh, well, according to the city staff report, uh, we did some analysis. Um, you know, it's in tens of millions is the, is the estimates in the city staff reports. Okay. And you had your discussions with city staff on this, on this subject? We have had numerous discussions with city staff, yes. Okay, that's all I have. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Are there any other questions of the deputant? Seeing none, we'll move on. Thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, final speaker is Paul Scrivener. Welcome, Mr. Scrivener. You've got five minutes. Thank you. Uh, Councillors, good morning. Um, I'm here today to represent the Toronto Industry Network and uh, to amplify the comments that we made in a letter which I think you have before you. Uh, it was delivered yesterday. And we want to say that, uh, first of all, TIN, uh, just to give you, just to remind you, uh, it has about 22 members. Uh, most of them are large manufacturers. Three of them are uh, manufacturing associations. And uh, we have about 15,000 employees. Um, IMIT, uh, we endorse the staff's recommendations as they uh, pertain to the manufacturing sector. We like the idea that uh, the program would be uh, uh, changed to be a citywide one. And one of the reasons for that is that uh, several of our members' uh, manufacturing facilities are island. In other words, they're not part of an employment area. It, as an incentive, uh, we believe IMED is important to, uh, first of all, encourage reinvestment uh, by manufacturers in Toronto, and secondly, of course, to uh, attract new uh, developments. And we need the mix of jobs. As we said in our letter, there are 90,000 manufacturing jobs in Toronto, plus about five times that number in uh, spin-off jobs. An important factor in supporting uh, the continuation of IMIT is the um, uh, competition that we face uh, from the United States. And I think you're familiar with this. It's an ongoing uh, issue. And uh, anything that can, the city can do other levels of government can do to encourage manufacturers to stay in Toronto is a good thing for our city. Uh, we want to retain jobs here. Manufacturing jobs are good jobs. And so, as I say, uh, we would like very much that uh, your committee uh, endorse the staff report. Thank you very much. Happy to answer questions. Thank you very much. Are there any questions of the deputant by members of the committee? Seeing none, thank you very much, sir. Are there any of the speakers to PG 31.5? Okay, seeing none, uh, committee members, questions? Councillor Perks. Um, how much money has the city spent and committed uh, as a result of the IMIT program as of today? About a half a billion dollars. Half a billion? Billion dollars. Okay, um, that's all I need. Thank you. Councillor Campbell, question. How do, we, uh, how do we reach out and publicize this program? So we meet uh, regularly with the real estate industry, both the associations and, and major players uh, to inform them of that. Uh, we do the normal communications with, uh, on, on our uh, website. Uh, we do uh, special uh, information sessions in the various parts of Toronto to let them know about a variety of services, and we always focus on the IMED program in those sessions. Do, do we reach out to any other industries other than the real estate industry? Well, to, to the user, it's so the manufacturing tin, for instance, and others, so that we, we try to get to as many potential applicants as we can. Okay, could, so do we, do we engage with, um, you know, conventions that come to Toronto? 
Uh, certainly you know, I mean, when, when, sorry, when conventions come to Toronto, you know, dozens and dozens of companies come to Toronto. I'm just wondering if we in, engage in, in, with any of those uh, enterprises. Sometimes, depending upon the convention, and if they're appropriate, and so NAOP, which is a North American uh, organization of uh, in, uh, office uh, buildings, so we had a we did a special presentation to them, uh, but we also marketed through. Toronto Global and any other uh, occasions we have when pitching Toronto to the rest of the world. Okay, that's all. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Campbell, Councillor Campbell. Um, I've got a question. The you mentioned there was half a billion spent on the program to date. How many years is that? So that's about ten years, uh, and that's uh, half a billion on an incre increment of almost a billion, 900 and something million in new taxes. So the grant comes out of the new taxes. So it's uh, uh, based on upon a principle of um, if it if wasn't for the incentive, then the, the new taxes wouldn't come. And right. this report addresses that issue with respect to the downtown area, that uh, it's no longer needed in the core of the downtown, but it's, the uh, consultants and staff's opinion is still needed outside the downtown. Right, and uh, over those over that time period, do you have a number off the top of your head and how, how many square feet of employment space was created? About 10 million. About 10 million. And do you have a number uh, within the 10 million, how many jobs that equates to? 60. New jobs? It's about 65,000. 65,000 New and jobs. retained. Paying income tax. Correct. On top of property tax. Okay, thank you. Are there any other questions? Have one, more. one more question. We'll go back to Councillor Perks. Uh, I'm not sure who this is to. I saw something recently about um, the value of building permits in the commercial industrial sector. Ten years ago, something like 55, 60% of the value of building permits in the Greater Toronto Area was 905 and the rest was City of Toronto. And now they, that's pretty much flipped, am I? So uh, you're correct, 10 years and earlier than that, about two thirds of a non-res building permits was in the 905, about the time the IMED came in, that began to flip and it has flipped. In the most recent year or two, the data is now bouncing around closer to a 50-50 split, but it's still, uh, Still the majority of the city, yes. Majority in the city of Toronto. Correct. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, to speak, who would like to speak on this item? Councillor Perks. So speak. I have a whole pile of motions. If I could just work through them here. So this first motion was provided to me by the, the general manager of economic development. Effectively, if you think of uh, the uh, Metrolinx station, we had a community benefits agreement. This is sort of a miniature community benefits agreement. If you get the IMET uh, grant, then similar to what happened with the Metrolinx lands, you have to do some employment and training opportunities, try to get rid of some of the precarious employment in the building trades and so on and so forth. This is the kind of practice we're seeing with community benefits agreements all over the place. So the general manager provided me with this. Next motion, please. Okay, so there's a series of these here. Um, the first is to eliminate office as a category uh, that's eligible for IMET grants. Um, it's long been my view that uh, the Toronto economy and the, is, is over-dependent and it's almost becoming a, a monoculture in terms of employment uh, with its reliance on office. And if we're going to be trying to attract jobs, uh, attracting them as we have in the film industry and in the food industry, we should be using these grants to diversify our economy instead of continuing to attract office. It boggles my mind that we actually gave an IMIT grant to the Globe and Mail to build a new headquarters in the city of Toronto, like they were gonna go to Hamilton. Um, 
can, and the next one is uh, to eliminate the IMIT grants in the smart track zones. In the proposal in front of you, there's a phase out. And uh, what I'm arguing here is instead of phasing it out, we should simply stop it. The construction of transit infrastructure is itself the public investment that you make to attract jobs. Uh, and in fact, when uh, Smart Track was proposed, the argument that was made is that it would attract so much new business that the tax revenue from the new business that Smart Track would attract would pay for a substantial portion of the cost of the stations. Now, if that's true, if the fact of building a Smart Track station generates new tax revenue, why on earth are we giving an additional tax benefit to the same people we're supposed to be making money from. Like we're paying money to go away and at the same time claiming it's coming in. It makes no sense at all. Um, it, it's, it's pushing and pulling at the same time. So if we're going to spend uh, a few billion dollars in public money to make a, uh, the areas more attractive to employers, fine, we'll do that. But let's not spend twice to get the same result. Uh, fourth one is that each grant come to council for approval. You heard earlier that uh, the, the dollar value of the foregone tax revenue from the IMIP program is now half a billion dollars. Uh, it's only recently that we had any clue that it was up to that height because they would get approved and get buried down into reports and it's only if you were reading the fine print in the analyst notes for the Economic Development Department that you were noticing that number growing and growing and growing. And this is nothing on the, the general manager, this is on us, councillors, we're not watching. Um, finally, uh, in the proposal in front of you, there's a suggested floor of um, uh, five million, and my proposal is that the floor be three million. I wanna make sure that we're uh, encouraging those innovative startups to be part of this program. I had an additional one. Uh, in the, when they come to council for approval, that they bring, uh, that the report include, hmm? Is it, is it further down? Ah, three, yeah. Um, one, of the, one of the criticisms that people have made is that uh, we can't actually tell how many jobs have come as a result of this, uh, net new jobs, and, and that should be part of the regular reporting. If the purpose is to attract jobs, we should actually know how many jobs are, are being attracted. Uh, a summary comment I'd like to make about all of this. Um, I can't think of another area of public policy where we have incrementally spent a half a billion dollars with the lack of council oversight. It's, it's, it's mind boggling. In an environment where uh, we can't afford to build affordable housing fast enough, where we can't afford to run enough buses on our bus routes, where families can't get childcare, where we have so many pressing needs and there's never any money to do any of it, um, the idea that half a billion dollars got spent on this and it was never really compared for efficacy to these other things has always been worrisome to me. But I'm prepared to keep going with it. Uh, I think it's time we limited it. We have to remember it was brought in uh, at, during the global financial crisis when we weren't sure there were gonna be any jobs coming to Toronto. And so the, the program was I quite expansive and I think it's up. time to rein it in a bit. Are there questions of the mover of the motion? Not seeing any. Uh, I have a motion that I will place. It has been drafted by the staff in regards to this item here, and they have asked that I put it on. If there are any questions of me of it, I will refer them to staff for their consideration of it. But if Clerk staff could make sure that there's a chance for my colleagues to read it.
I will speak to the item that's in front of us. Um, Councillor Perks has two motions. I think the first one I'm okay with, the second one I'm not. I think we have a difference of opinion. Uh, I don't mind investing some of the funds that we're receiving from what uh, I've uh, been advised, I've looked at and considered. And, and you're welcome after I speak to ask staff questions on it. I said anything you want to ask me, I'll just refer to them to answer for you because they drafted it. So in looking at the IMET initiative and looking at what we're, where we were 10 years ago to now, I think that answers the question in the first place that people are coming back to the City of Toronto. They're understanding the value of moving into the City of Toronto. We are desperately in need of employment. We're trying to protect our employment areas with our official plan policies. We're trying to expand public transit. We're even trying to make a goal line look like it's an intercity line by putting in smart track stations when it's really an interregional line, but it's a stopgap measure to get us there, to get people moving around the city and come into employment areas. So looking at any way that we can continue to do that and to have some type of economic benefit uh, in that for the people that are looking to build offices here, I think is great. Uh, this change to the program now says no more in the downtown because downtown is thriving. It's not necessary anymore. It's created its goal. We're seeing new office space, and we're trying to be able to match that, at least with some of the employment. But in the rest of the areas of the city, I think it's a program that we've initiated that we think works, and that we think, we, at least from my perspective, should continue. So uh, I'm not concerned about reinvesting the dollars that are, what are new dollars in property taxes within the city to do that in even a place like the Globe and Mail. So they moved. No one said they had to stay in Toronto. They could have moved anywhere that they wished to move because now things are becoming virtual and it's only the reporters that may be in the locations and they often live near here and many of them live along one of the subway lines and take the subway into work but they don't go back to their office to do their work. And having a new office building built and having them stay in the city I think was a great thing to do because we wouldn't have wanted to see one of our newspapers leave our city into a 905 region somewhere else. I think it would have been somewhat embarrassing if we would have had that. So I'm supportive of the plan. I'll take a difference of opinion than my colleague um, and uh, support the initiatives. And then if my colleagues have questions, would you like me to bring staff to the floor on the motion I have? Okay, so I'll leave it to Economic Development, Michael. Question. So, first a general question, and then I'd like. Well, I guess the way I should do it is with the committee's permission to bring staff back to the floor to answer questions. All those in favor? Oppose. That's carried. So, um, the first question, if we can go through them one at a time, how do these differ from what you are recommending? Sure. So I'll go through them one at a time. Uh, on the first one, it's a, it's a technical amendment in a way that finance suggested. We did not address it in the main report. There are the odd situation where a development occurs on land that is currently not taxed for whatever reason. Uh, and so the grant is paid on the increment value from the current tax level to the new tax level. And so it doesn't make sense for a developer to take advantage of the fact that the land was for whatever reason not taxed. So that this motion says that you have to take a base value, ascribe a base value. It makes sense, it, it's uh, staff are in agreement with that. And it only applies to properties that are currently paying no tax? Correct. Okay. The second one is that the current report's language wasn't specific enough. We'd, we'd suggested there should be a cap for grants below 150 and it addresses the issue that's already been raised today about how much delegated authority uh, staff should have. Um, but it left it sounding like it was a cap on all developments. There are major developments that come here where a lot, much larger incentive 
would be uh, sensible. And so this motion says that with council approval on those projects, which there has to be, then there could be a larger uh, um, IMED grant awarded, but it would be at the discretion of council. With the as re who would recommend it? Staff would recommend it. And when, we say, when I say staff, I should indicate that all approvals for IMED grants and considerations for IMED grants are thoroughly vetted by economic development and culture, planning and planning, finance, uh, and legal, so that uh, it's a consensus approach within those four divisions, between those four divisions. And this was, this is a change that you thought was desirable between the time that you signed the report that's before us and today? It's, it's a realization that the wording we wrote in the report was not specific enough and we wanted to make it more specific. Okay. Number three. Number three is uh, a request and a number of, of, of indiv uh, a number of uh, commentators have pointed out that our growth in employment in the in the growth the growth centers which are provincially mandated most of them are in Etobicoke North York and Scarborough and it includes Young and Eglinton and it includes downtown but downtown we've already said is not eligible uh, that we should provide an, in, an extra inducement and so uh, we brought this uh, further modification for committee and council's consideration. But again, this is something where you've had a change of thinking between the time you signed the report and today? Correct, and part of it's tied to the report did change the fact that employment zones had an extra uh, grant and we took that away in favor of targeted sectors being able to get an extra grant. But in reflection, we were missing an opportunity to help promote growth uh, in those areas that need the help the most. And four? Four is uh, uh, discussions with the proponent uh, for the Unilever site uh, in that uh, the current report says that uh, IMIT should be phased out in the Liberty Village area and the Unilever area um, due to the fact that the city and other orders of government are investing, as already has been noted, significant amounts of money. The consultants and staff uh, felt that a incentive at the beginning of the process was necessary to get development going which is really what we did effectively, I believe, in downtown Toronto. Incentive assisted with the growth rate in downtown Toronto. The growth rate takes hold. It's no longer needed. The same thing is true, we believe, in uh, Liberty and Unilever. However, the, there is a GO station already in the Liberty Village area. There is no GO station uh, in the uh, uh, Unilever area and there will not be until 2022 at the earliest. So it made sense to keep the incentive as a solid incentive to get development going at the beginning of when the station opens so that uh, usage of the station is strong from the get-go. And so the staff recommends the incentive should stay in place until that trigger point. Once that station is open, uh, then th we would phase out so that there's still incentives, so it's not uh, shutting off uh, development there by removing the incentive, but that it lowers it down. There's still a significant amount of incentives uh, in the first, especially in the first five years of the 10 year phase out. So we believe that process helps bring forward development that would have taken much longer to happen, which benefits the general tax roll and benefits the operations by having more users of the uh, station. A uh, question of the chief planner. Um, from your point of view, are all of these desirable changes to the report? Yes. Okay, thank you. Are there other questions of staff? Councillor DiCiano. Thank you. Um, 
<clears throat> with respect to the first motion tabled by Councillor Perks, um, could you provide uh, perhaps an opinion on whether or not you see the uh, introduction of um, <clears throat> certain rules to being eligible as as a as an impediment to uh, attracting employment in this area or in the in the city. So this this amendment comes uh, and is consistent with the spirit of the report that's in front of you, where we indicated we felt that there should be more, and we asked for some time to 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 uh, consult with all the stakeholders, including the labor council and, and others. Uh, the world of community benefits agreements is is shifting and getting better, if I put it that way, because of all the conversations, especially around Eglinton Crosstown and, and others, including recently the Woodbine development. So uh, we think it's appropriate. These are very large sums of money, and for the city to maximize both the fiscal return and employment uh, and the economic impact they have, it makes sense for there, there to be some um, uh, greater uh, requirement when a project gets an IMAC grant versus when it gets just a regular approval. Okay, that's my question. Thank you. Any other questions of staff? Any other speakers? So we can start some voting. Yep. Madam Clerk, what do I ask for the vote on first? So the first item we're going to vote on is Councillor Perk's motion in front of us. All those in favor? Sorry, this is one you just asked questions on. All those in favor? Any opposed? That carries. The next item. So I, if I could, I'd like to vote on each of these five separately. Thank you. So we've been asked to split this for voting. Item number one. All those in favor? Opposed? That does not carry. Item number two. All those in favor? Sure. Recorded vote on item number two. So all of those in favor of part two before you. Councillor Perks, all opposed? Councillor Campbell, Councillor Shiano, Councillor Shiner, Councillor Fillion, that motion loses. Item number three. All those in favor? Would you like it on the wall? No. Oh, okay. All, All those, those in favor of part three of the motion before you? Councillor Perks. All those opposed? Councillor, Councillor Campbell, Councillor Chiano, Councillor Shiner, Councillor Fillion, that motion loses. Item number four. All those in favor? Opposed? That does not carry. Item number five. All those in favor? Opposed? That does not carry. There is a motion I put forward. None. So the motion that I put forward here on behalf of staff, all those in favor? Any opposed? That's carried the item as amended. All those in favor? Any opposed? Councillor Perks? That carries. But it... No, but it... Sorry. In, in fairness to my colleague, raising his hand very high does feel good. But it's a sole opposition. Um, we have one more item at 11.15, amendments to the commercial facade improvement program and applicable community improvement plan. I didn't have any speakers on this. Are there any speakers in the room that wanted to speak to this item? Seeing none, are there any members of non-committee that wish to speak to it? Seeing none, just vote, don't ask the item. You do have a question. Questions from committee members on item number six. Councillor Campbell. A quick 
question, the question is, um, why is this uh, grant program available only for, B for BIAs? when you know, it specifically references strip plazas, and many strip plazas, part of, the ra part of the rationale for reviewing the program is the recognition of strip plazas as places of important commercial and cultural activity. Well, I don't know about cultural activity, but commercial activity. But, so but uh, many strip plazas are not part of BIA, so I'm just wondering why this is exclusive to, BI to uh, companies operating within BIAs. So through you, Mr. Chair, just to clarify, you have to be a strip plaza within a BIA? Right. Okay. So second question, why? Uh, the question is why is that? Why only in BIAs? Yeah. Because we're trying to achieve uh, as much impact as possible with the funds that are available. And we believe by uh, uh, providing this incentive to s property owners and BIAs, it complements the efforts that are already underway with BIAs to achieve a bigger impact. Okay, I, I understand that, but is there, do you not, is there not, are we not thereby excluding other uh, opportunities to, you know, beautify streetscapes where there are not business improvement areas? Well, it's uh, not an unlimited uh, source of funds, right, right. so you could, uh, if it were offered across the city, spread it so thin that it would minimize the impact. Okay, that's fine. Thank you. Are there any oh, other questions? Okay. Staff? Not seeing any. Oh, I didn't see you. They didn't raise your hand high enough, Councillor Perks. I heard it last time. Councillor Perks, questions of staff. Um, so in the report, it says that you're going to be funding the extra cost by changing something else in the Economic Development Department's budget ask, but I didn't really understand what. Through you, Mr. Chair, as it stands now, um, we have some funding uh, for financed uh, cost share, uh, capital cost share projects. Yes. In 2019, we don't have any of those uh, on the table. So we're just going to reallocate those funds for um, uh, finance cost program. shared programs. I'm afraid I just don't know what you mean. So we have the 50/50 cost share program. Oh, we're not touching that. But we also have a financed option where the city will fund larger projects, where we fund 35 percent of the total cost, and the BIA picks up uh, the rest through a loan with the city. Yes. We are. We don't have any projects in the pipeline okay. utilizing that type of cost share, so we're going to reallocate it to the facility. So I have to ask the the uncomfortable question then, which is: so next year works, but we're locking ourselves in to uh, an enriched facade program, and what happens when you do have a BIA that comes forward and wants to do the? the 35 percent deal so uh through you mr chair i, I think we need to monitor uh, at, as as we go along and um we'll see how much take up there is with these changes to the facade program and if adjustments need to be made uh, we will make those at, at the time i just uh, just to uh, clarify because this program is a grant to private uh, companies, we need a community improvement program to do it. So to make any changes, we always have to do a CIP change. And that's w the conundrum we're in. We don't have the flexibility of just doing this through the budget process. Councillor Perks understands that. I just wanted to make sure everybody did. So, oh, we're finished with questions. Councillor Perks, did you have a motion in regards to this? No. Okay, to my colleagues, Councillor Campbell, Councillor DeChannel, there's no other questions, are there any motions? No. Speakers? Well, that's what I'm about. Somewhere in my office, I have a list of the different programs we have to provide subsidies, incentives, gifts, grants, uh, community improvement grants uh, to businesses. 
It's a very, very, very long list. And what's interesting to me is I, I can't think of a year since I've been here when we haven't invented a new one. So I think that we're finished with that. We now have the item in front of us. Um, it's moved for staff report. Yeah. Councillor Campbell, you're moving the staff recommendations for approval. All those in favor? Any opposed? That does carry. To my colleagues, just before we go on with the larger item we have a number of deputations for, when we dealt with PG 31.9, which was how does the city grow? Councillor DiCiano and Councillor Campbell and Councillor Perks. Uh, it was not originally going to go to council. It was an item that was here for information. However, we did support the motion from Councillor Perks. And it said city council direct the chief planner and executive director, city planning to request CMHC to provide data to the city showing trends in the overall supply of affordable housing. Because it, well, because of that, it has to go to council. If you would, or so, can we request staff to bring that next year, or does it have to go to council? It's going to council because if you're going to ask intergovernmental requests, council has to do that. That's what clerks is telling me. So I don't, just a heads up, it is going to council. Uh, we have a motion, so it will be there and to members of the public that may have heard the previous announcement, it wasn't. So now we have in front of us the item you've all been waiting for, PG 31.7, Midtown and Focus final report. So the Planning and Growth Management Committee is continuing to hold a statutory special public meeting that commenced on June 7, 2018 in accordance with Section 26 of the Planning Act for item PG 31.7, Midtown and Focus final report. We have a series of speakers that are here. We have the local council here and we had a, a public meeting and we have a subsequent report that's here. Would my colleagues like maybe to have staff just give us an update as to where we're at and what we're dealing with today so we'll know what it is officially when we go forward with this and hear the speakers? A two minute update. I would request that if there is a motion coming from the chair uh, that is already ready to go, that that be circulated so that we could ask questions related to it, rather I, than what happened last time, which was last minute motion, and then we had to go back to asking questions of staff. At this point, I don't have a motion. I know that the local councillor has asked that we support option three. So what's generally going to be in front of us will be one that will be dealing with the items that are here and supporting another option uh, which would reduce the density uh, in, or the heights and densities in some of the locations. Uh, I don't have a motion prepared at this point in time. Okay, if at some point you do have one, if you could circulate it, that would be. Uh, what I'll do is any motion I have as I have had the, uh, try to always have the courtesy of, I will ask with the committee's permission for staff to be able to comment on that if you so wish. Thank you. Or to, at least you can ask questions on that. Um, so, to I guess our chief planner, can you give us a brief um, idea of what we're, we're continuing the previous meeting. We had public speakers. We're allowing public speakers to come back. We've had some public consultations. What are we dealing with today? Uh, through the chair, that's exactly what I was just going to say. But uh, <laughs> this, uh, 
We, we were uh, at, the, at the June meeting, the committee commenced a special public meeting to consider our final report on a, on a new uh, secondary plan for Young and Eglinton. The, um, the committee uh, heard a number of deputations uh, that day and the committee directed the staff to go out and host a further consultation meeting uh, in the community. Uh, there have, as noted in the final report, an extensive three-year process. So a further meeting on some of the issues that were raised in the deputations that we heard that day, and specifically to uh, solicit feedback from the public on lowering building heights in various character areas. As you recall, the plan identified uh, uh, how growth will play out in Young and Eglinton over the 25-year horizon of the plan. And there were particular concerns about building heights in some of those character areas, uh, the Sudan apartment neighborhood, the Eglinton Green Line area, the Young and Eglinton Crossroads, and the Red Path Park Street Loop character areas and specifically soliciting feedback from the public on lowering those heights. And secondly, looking at opportunities to increase employment. And there was discussion uh, during the uh, debate or the debate and the um, deputations about the importance of growing employment in Young and Eglinton. So we proceeded uh, with that direction. Uh, we went out and spoke to the public on June the 21st. A uh, meeting was held, well attended meeting and uh, we were requested to come back with uh, a report on, uh, on uh, and it's a supplementary report that you have in front of you and it, it uh, summarizes the outcomes of the meeting that we held on June the 21st and as requested by the committee, it uh, puts various options in front of the committee for uh, potential amendments uh, that look at various changes to the building, uh, permitted building type and height limits that, are, uh, that were in the original report and uh, provide you with some further commentary. We were also specifically asked to comment on whether or not those options would conform and be consistent with the various provincial plans and policies that, that would apply. So we provide you with a supplementary report containing all of that information for your consideration today. And in addition to all of that, of course, the final report is still in front of you with staff summation of uh, the three-year project and the, uh, the, uh, the base uh, staff recommendations in the package uh, represented by the official plan amendment. Thank you, and we can go to questions of staff on that item and other questions you might have after we hear deputations. So it's 12.25. Um, I know everybody's here. We're going to break at 12.30 anyways. So it might be best if we just have all the deputations start at 1.30 sharp. When we'll all be back here for that. Uh, I would ask all the committee members, because of the large number of deputants that are here, to please try and be back uh, at 1.30 if you can. I know you often do things during council. And we'll hear from all the deputations then. Thank you. Thank you. 